And the person I'll be talking to is actually a Niner from Samarkand. And he's, he's one of the youngest Niners in the entire country. He's currently studying in the U.S. My dad used to say, I'm supporting you right now, financially, mentally, emotionally. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to make sure that you are growing up to be mm -hmm. someone, you know, who can give back to the community. I do remember like writing my daily plan, printing it out and then hanging it on my wall, you know, just trying to create that study spirit for myself. And I used to study for eight to nine hours a day. Like I really want to be a student again, guys. All right, I'm starting to change my mind about teaching and my current job, right? <laughs> Seriously, though, after these two episodes I had <clears throat> with U.S. students, all right, I want to go back to school now. It gets really interesting at that point. You start seeing that companies are basically, okay, positioning themselves in ways where they claim to have cash that mm -hmm. they do not have mm -hmm. and get credibility for that. So they make money out of thin air, you know? Mm -hmm. If you are in that part of accounting, it's never boring. You are thinking about things that are beyond the scope of this world when you have a purpose that's much higher. Like when you, pur you, when you have a purpose that's much higher than this, you know, that's how you're like uh, chasing eternal happiness, feeling peace inside and just like going on with your life. Points. Money does that's not change points, people. Yeah. It simply reveals them. Yeah. It finally gives them the tools yeah. to express what's really inside. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and there's also a quote that goes, make your friends rich, make your enemies rich, and find out which is which. Hey folks, hey everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Adustra Muse. I'm your host, Muhammad Ali here. Today, I'm going to be talking to another great guest. And the person I'll be talking to is actually a Niner from Samarkand. And he's, he's one of the youngest Niners in the entire country. He's currently studying in the U.S. and I can't wait to ask him some questions about education, learning IELTS, and etc. So if you guys are interested, keep watching. All right, Mr. Sukhrab, Mr. Sukhrab Muradov, yes. thanks for coming on the show. Thank you too. Thank you for inviting. Yeah, nice All to right. be here. Yeah, it is such a pleasure having you on the show today. And, but you know, before we get started, I want to get something something straight. You are the first youngest Niner or the second youngest Niner? I am the first youngest Niner and uh. I'm the first Niner in Samarkand. Okay. Yeah. Here's the deal. When your friend, Mr. Babarjan, reached out to me about this podcast, guess what he said? He said, I'm going to bring with me my friend and he's the second youngest Niner. Oh, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> I thought you were asking about the timing of our exams. You are uh -huh. Okay, so you were asking about the age difference, right? Yes, he's younger than me, uh -huh. but I took the exam first and he uh -huh. took the second. Okay. So yeah, factually, he's the youngest Niner. Uh -huh. I thought when you when you are saying the second youngest Niner, like you mean the timing. Uh, yeah. no, what I meant is like the youngest, youngest. Oh, no, so no, no, who's no, no, the youngest? No, he is the youngest. He's actually. clearly yeah, the, he youngest. Is the youngest. Okay, yeah. I see. So what's like the age difference? Two and a half months. Uh, two and a half months. Yes. My, my birthday is on May. He's on uh -huh. August. So yeah. Oh, yeah. Happens. Your birthday is coming up soon, right? <laughs> yeah, it is coming up soon. Like after it literally is. a week, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday if I'm not oh, thank around. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So what do you, would you like to tell our audience a little about yourself? Uh, all right. So my name is Sufrav Muradov. As it was already mentioned, I'm currently a rising junior at University of South Florida, studying accounting and finance. Not like accounting, accounting. I'm studying quantitative accounting, actually. Mm -hmm. It's slightly different. Mm -hmm. uh, I come from Samarkand. I was born and raised in Bulungur, uh, not the city part. Like we move, we move it to the city later. But I come uh, from the region, like mm -hmm. call it uh, Bulungur. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So describe Sukhrab as a teenager what were you like when you were a teenager when you were much younger i mean you still are a teenager right <laughs> you know <laughs> okay when i went to primary and secondary school this is what my teachers kept saying mm -hmm. to my parents uh, -huh. uh i think your son your, your son is gonna become a philosopher or a poet uh -huh. someone in that part of things you know because i was thoughtful all the time like i wasn't very sociable i really used to think too much you know like, it was obvious that I'm thinking about something. Uh -huh. So, yeah, like, and I actually have always thought deep, you mm -hmm. know, about things, about mm -hmm. how things work and etc. Uh, that's how I was as a teenager. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I had strict parents. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I think the responsibility I felt because of them, you know, they always used to remind me that I'm the oldest one, you know, in the family. Mm -hmm. I've got them, uh, my younger siblings to care for. 
Like my dad used to say, I'm supporting you right now, financially, mentally, emotionally. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you have to make sure that you are growing up to be mm-hmm. someone, you know, who can give back to the community, someone mm-hmm. uh, worthy. So like the respons- the sense of responsibility, that sense of responsibility he instilled in me, you know, like that has always made me think ahead. That has always made me mature. Mm-hmm. So like, uh, yeah, I've been thinking all the time, you know, about what I want to do in the next mm-hmm. five to 10 years, 15 mm-hmm. years. I wasn't carefree, I mm-hmm. would say. Yeah. And have you kept that part of you? Do you still have that part of you? Yeah, I do. Uh-huh. I do. Yeah. Like uh, if you, if you really talk to me, you know, uh, if we see talk for one hour, two hours, three hours, and that conversation elongates, oh. I can go like really, really deep on certain topics, you know? Uh, but I think it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I learned it to analyze deep, you know? I see people making the same mistakes over and over again. I see people not being able to think for themselves. Like they are too much influenced by societal expectations, right? Mm-hmm. By what people consider to be right or wrong. Mm-hmm. But I don't do that. If I see something going wrong, I analyze it and make independent decisions for myself. So like, you know, I feel like a stranger Mm -hmm. who is standing on the side and watching all people, you Mm -hmm. know, like going in the wrong, not all people, like Mm -hmm. people going in the wrong direction, in the right direction and learning basically from what they do from from their mistakes, Mm -hmm. improving uh, that way. Yeah. Have you have you always had that quality or is it something you developed along the way? This is a really good question. That's what I always wanted to get back to, you know? Uh-huh. Like, I wanted to get to the deepest roots of it. Uh-huh. Where did that come from? Like, was I always like that? Or did I develop this trait? Is it natural and, like, nurtured? Like, uh-huh. You know, calling it scientifically. But this is the conclusion I came to. I don't remember my earliest childhood, right? But at least I remember the times when I went to kindergarten, for example. I, re- I remember the faces of my friends and et cetera. And I can say I have always been like that. It's mm-hmm. like an inborn quality, mm-hmm. you know? Like it's not, yeah, it, I have developed it more as I was growing up because of parental expectations, as I told, and I actually thank them for that mm-hmm. because if it was not for that pressure, uh, I think like the surroundings I had, because I, I didn't mm-hmm. have very good surroundings, to be honest, like I would choose a different direction. I would pick a different direction, but as I was feeling that pressure, you know, like, uh, growing up in that environment, that quality of mind, that part of my mind, thoughtfulness, it just strengthened it. But did it like come because of my surroundings, like with timing and etc., or was it inborn? I would say it was inborn. Like, yeah, the earliest part of my childhood, I can remember, I was like that all the time. You know what's funny? What? You, your friend, are both the eldest in the family. Both you and your friend are the eldest in the family. Yeah, we and are. Guess what? I'm also the eldest in the family. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Look at yeah. this and, pattern, right? <laughs> yeah, I think I think there's a pattern. It's just yeah. the eldest member of the family, the eldest sibling in the family, they tend to have this innate sense of responsibility, yeah. right? And that responsibility kind of pushes them to think things through yeah. and pu- push pushes them to think, to challenge the status quo, to really think outside the box, right? To yeah. look beyond because they have to come up with answers. They have to come up with solutions yeah. because yeah. there are so many people looking to them for answers, for help, right? Yeah. I guess, I guess that part of it comes from that. The fact that we, we have this burden on our shoulders yeah. looking after our younger siblings <laughs> and then eventually our parents yeah. when we grow older, right? I, I, I guess part of it comes from that. The fact that we're the eldest in the family. You are actually right. But Mm. I think you somehow mean it's genetic, you know, because Mm -hmm. you told it's innate. Uh, I think that's culture. And actually, this is one of the best parts of our culture, you know. Mm -hmm. If you go elsewhere, like, okay, if we look at the Western world, right? Not Eastern part of the world. Mm -hmm. If we look at the Western world, America, some European countries that fall there, they don't have this pattern Mm -hmm. because they know that once they are 18, they can either stay with their parents and it's mm-hmm. going to be like a shame on them because like staying mm-hmm. with parents after 18, I don't know why mm-hmm. they consider it to be a shame. They consider it to be shameful. Uh, since they know it, you know, since they know that they're going to become independent, care for their lives, they are not obliged to care for their parents or siblings. Mm-hmm. They do not develop this as, as they grow up. Mm-hmm. But in Uzbek culture, I haven't been to Kazakh culture, for example, to neighboring countries, you know, but I know this thing for sure. In Uzbek culture, like in 85% of cases, that's like 
are what happens. The eldest like mm-hmm. kids in the family, they have the sense of responsibility. Mm-hmm. And as they grow up, they grow up to be more like diligent, you know? Mm-hmm. They don't avoid work. They want to do more. They want to bring something to the table, mm-hmm. bring something to the family. Like unlike their like younger siblings, you know, who are more or less carefree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in that in that sense, I agree with you actually. Yeah. 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 It's so mind blowing if you think about it, how our, you know, order in the family and our culture, you know predicts or are strong predictors of our future success yeah. and our ambition level yeah that's actually a really good thing because i want to add something uh-huh. uh as i okay i'm an economist right uh-huh. yeah i do study accounting and finance and etc but I, I took like economics classes mm-hmm. all of those things somehow go back to economics right mm-hmm. and in particular i'm interested in behavioral economics mm-hmm. so i read books like free economics right mm-hmm. outliers i think you did too malcolm gladwell mm-hmm. I, I don't remember who wrote free economics mm-hmm. and they have good really really good observations mm-hmm. uh in outliers malcolm gladwell was like bringing up the example of afro-americans in the u.s right most of them once they grow up they suffer from poverty like that's just a pattern. I don't want to discuss why and how. Like mm-hmm. uh, that's not something I want to talk about. But then he connects it to basketball. If you look at NBA, National Basketball Association, most of the successful players are actually Afro Americans, if not all. Like ninety percent of them are Afro Americans, right? And this is what happens. This is the question: Why all Afro American kids start playing basketball once they are in primary school, but only some of them get more successful, even though they had the same trainers, even though they they had the same skills, the same opportunities. Why that happens? That happens because of timing, you know? The kids uh, who sign up for basketball classes, let's say in winter, have more opportunities to go to like uh, competitions, Olympias the next year, while the kids who come and sign up in fall do not have those opportunities. So the kids who start earlier, they step into success earlier than the like than the younger not the younger than their peers who came later to sign up for those classes Mm -hmm. and just because of that after one competition they go to another then to another and this chain keeps going you know and that's how they get successful they are in a spot so like what you said is actually really really similar to that just because of our situation you know just because of timing just because we were born first Mm -hmm. like we feel more responsibility Mm -hmm. as a result like it urges us to do more more Mm -hmm. work right and then like in life I wouldn't say we get more successful. That would be a little egoistic, I'd say. Mm. I'd say, but like we accomplish more, like comparably. Yeah. Do you think it's unfair on our younger siblings? You think? Do you think we have an unfair advantage? No, we don't. We don't, because yes, like it is pressure that drives us, mm-hmm. right? It is pressure that drives us. But if they wanted it really bad, they would do it too. Mm-hmm. Like. Um, I, I don't know if it's relevant here or no, but there is nothing impossible, you know? They shouldn't be blaming us just because we are the oldest and our parents created everything for us. No, they have done the same things for them as well, right? If not more. They are if actually creating better conditions for your younger siblings. This is what I'm noticing. When I was my brother's age, for example, I didn't have, like, the okay, I had the best conditions. I thank my parents for that. They are ordinary, like, for example, government people. They don't make a lot mm. of money, mm-hmm. but they've been investing in me, you know? They've been creating, like, every condition I needed to become the best version of myself. But if I look at my brother right now, they're creating better conditions for him and he doesn't take an advantage of that. Mm -hmm. So like before pointing their fingers to us, they should look at themselves, you know, uh, and take the responsibility for themselves. Yeah, this is what I would say. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I I actually sometimes wonder if my, you know what's (coughs) surprising? My youngest brother is is surprisingly an is an overachiever. Like he's in a lot of sense way more successful than me, I guess, is intellectually, right? And financially too. He's making a lot of money over in the US right now. I know you're gonna be watching this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and oh yeah. And and it, you know, despite being younger, he's he's probably the wisest in the family. Now I gotta give him I, I gotta give it to him. All right, I don't feel comfortable. Un- I don't feel uncomfortable saying that. So this idea that your order in the family dictates your intelligence level or your future success doesn't necessarily hold true, right? Yeah. But, okay. But at the same time, though, this responsive sense of responsibility 
we have as eldest members yes. of the family, as the eldest siblings, somewhat gives us a head start in life. It somewhat gives us this drive to work harder, to outwork, to get results instantly. It, it, it's, it almost creates this sense of urgency that things, ha things have to happen now, right? Yes, 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 yes. Mm. Okay. So it's a very slippery, slippery slope here saying that uh, the order in, in, in the family dictates your success. So okay. Because there are exceptions on mm -hmm. both ends of the you know, spectrum. You, there are, you got exceptions. You got overachievers, young, young, youngest siblings as overachievers, and you got elder siblings who are super, super successful. So that idea that theory may not necessarily be right. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Actually, here I agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, how? Okay. There are expectations in everything, right? Like science, facts, they cannot be true for mm -hmm. 100% like all the time. No, it's impossible. There are always ex like exceptions. But I generalize it, you know, because if you are the oldest child in the family, at least you have the pressure to start with. And human beings... They are driven by pressure and fears. Mm -hmm. We need to admit that, right? That pressure, that fear, the best way to cope with it mm -hmm. is to do something about it, mm -hmm. right? So your parents are not pressuring you. You feel the pressure. That there is the sense of responsibility they infuse in you as you grow up mm -hmm. turns into pressure, right? As time goes by. Mm -hmm. And how do you cope with that pressure? You do something about it. What are you feeling pressured about? About not making your parents proud with something, with something they are expecting from you. You go ahead, you work for that thing, right? You get it, and then you bring it back to your parents. You say, hey, like, look, uh, I got what you wanted from me. Mm -hmm. they, they, like, you see pride in their eyes. Mm -hmm. in, and that brings down the pressure you had initially, you know? Mm -hmm. That's how you save your, so yourself and keep moving on. So we are actually ruled by pressure and fears. And as the oldest child in your family, you have that pressure. But there is one more exception here. Not all human beings are the same. There are some human beings who once they take the responsibility, they do something about it. They try to execute it, right? And there are human beings who don't care, like nihilists. Do you know the term nihilism? Not really. Like, okay. So in philosophy, nihilists are people who don't see like motive behind anything. Mm -hmm. If they are getting a new phone, they ask themselves, why would I need a new phone? If they get a new car, why would I need a new car? Mm -hmm. Why would I need career success? Why would I need to leave? Like, they don't see purpose in life, you know? That's how pessimistic they are it's like the highest level of pessimism you can experience if they are nihilistic again they wouldn't care no matter how much their parents are pressuring them they wouldn't care it's all like you know like it all goes back to personality at the end of the day it all goes back to personality and with younger siblings even though they, they didn't have that pressure they might have inborn skills you know like traits that put them ahead in life if you put me and my brother for example yes i'm more hardworking than him I'm really diligent. I'm studying all the time. You know, I'm applying to internship, for example. I'm working, trying to build my career. I want to take an early start in life to make sure by the time I'm 30 to 35, I can care for my family. I can sustain them as well as they did me. You know, I want to give back. If you look at my brother, he doesn't have that. He doesn't have that urge. He doesn't have pressure. But when it comes to, for example, establishing relationships with people, right? getting on with someone, convincing someone, leading someone, he's much better than me. Mm -hmm. And just because he has got the, those traits, if you, he's given the opportunity, right, to lead, for example, I'm sure he's going to be much more successful than me because he's life smart, you know? Like, mm -hmm. unlike me, yeah, I am book smart, but when it comes to life smart, he's actually better than me, my brother. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm life stupid, I'm life smart too. I've got enough experience for my age, for example, right? Uh, but my brother, he's another level, you know? So uh, it goes back to personality, as I told. Like, mm -hmm. uh, ex there are exceptions in everything, right? And at the end of the day, personality plays a big role here as well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And you guys sort of complement each other, you know? And you'd, you'd form a great team if you guys decided to work on a project together. With my brother? Yeah. That's going to be problematic. <laughs> it because, is. Are you guys going to have trouble getting along? No, 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 no. I'm actually really close with my brother. Uh -huh. Like, I love him. Even when I'm in the US, I talk to him three to four times a day, you know? That's a how day. close we are. Yeah. A day. Like, he's. This, uh, guy, this guy talks <laughs> to his brother probably more often than he does to, uh, with his exactly. girlfriend. <laughs> I don't have a girlfriend, unfortunately. 
<laughs> or fortunately, I don't know. Okay, like we'll just like leave it for later. Uh-huh. But still, uh, you know, like you are right. I think if we work together, we are gonna make a great team. Mm. But I'm sure we are gonna have disagreements on a lot of things, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and just because he's my brother, I cannot be rude for, for with him. For example, I cannot be straight. Mm-hmm. I will be caring about how he's going to react mm-hmm. to my actions. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, as time passes by, it just accumulates and that partnership breaks down. So like, mm-hmm. if it's your own brother, mm-hmm. it is really hard. If it's your friend, you can work things out, right? Like you can agree on certain things. You can discuss, you have, ne- you can have negotiations with my brother. I, I cannot do that. That like, because we are too close, you know, C- close to the extent where negotiations cannot take place effectively. I see. But, I see what you're saying, but you know, at the same time, I think you guys will get over it. Like over time, once you mature, like yeah, right now, maybe. it may feel awkward, right? <coughs> yeah. Negotiating with your brother, right? Or splitting responsibilities. I'm going to do that. You do that. And he may not like it. And you guys can't work it out. That might be the case right now, but eventually you guys will get over it. Because I used to be in that spot. I uh-huh. thought I would never in a million years be working with my own brother, but here I am. Yeah. My brother is working with me. He's part of our editing team. I know, he also yeah. runs the school and he has a part-time job as a teacher. So mm-hmm. we're, we're, working th- we're working things out just fine. And if there is a problem, I'll tell him straight. I'm not holding back. Oh. I am not holding back. Just going to try to be objective. <laughs> and the reason why I decided to you know, bring him in is because you always want to have someone in your corner you can trust. You, you yeah. want to have someone in your corner you can trust. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And people might think of it as like a family business, but that's not really the way I see it. I'm not, I'm not bringing him in because he's family. Maybe because he's family, but for the most part, I want someone... I can count on. I want someone <coughs> I can I can turn to when I need instant help. I, I can't really go running to people, but I know I can go running to him. Right? I need that guy I can count on. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's like you're a wingman. <laughs> yeah, I can I, so, I see so what you, you mean. You do yeah. need someone in your corner like that. Someone with yeah. very strong integrity, right? Yeah, someone unless unless you're you. super lucky and happen to have a friend ride or die a friend, like Bob or John, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, you're not going to be able to have the, that kind of, you know, level of credibility with another human being unless you have some sort of a family relationship with them. So oh, yeah. it's not necessarily bad to go in business with your family member as long as you guys can stay, you know, objective and, you know, stay rational and not really get the emotions get in the way Mm, yeah yeah, but 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 after all you're gonna need someone you can trust in your corner all the time if you want to build something big like an empire i think you're right that's Uh, the matter of maturity i don't know who Uh he's gonna become after Uh a couple of years you know because Mm. right now he's only 16 he's Mm -hmm. gonna turn 16 that's why no he's gonna turn 17 actually Mm -hmm. so that's why i cannot judge if i can do business with him Mm -hmm. or no like you're right there Mm -hmm. if he matures maybe things Mm -hmm. are gonna change in, in you know like fall into place and we can yeah. do something together with yeah. Him. What, yeah what's gonna happen is as he, as he grows older <coughs> he's gonna have to take care of himself he's gonna have to make his own money right he's gonna have to have those responsibilities and he's gonna understand how the adult world works right yeah and then um, he he's gonna understand that for him to make a good living he's gonna need a decent job and he's gonna need all the help he can get and he's gonna be paranoid just like you, and start looking for answers. He's going to learn how to set emotions aside, yeah. right? Yeah. Reach out, coordinate, cooperate. So yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a matter of maturity, really. Just have yeah, to right. uh, let, you know, take things, take, take things. Uh, Seriously. Uh, no, let's let things take their natural course. That's what I was oh, going to yeah, say. Oh, yeah, yeah, take a natural course. Yeah. Wow. That was very well said, actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now what do you say we you talk a little about your language learning journey as well, your language learning experience, because a lot of the subscribers we got here, they usually watch our podcast because they're trying to level up their game with, yeah, yeah, step up their game with English. So how was your experience of learning English? So when did you start learning English? How did you feel at the time? And how, how do you feel about it now? 
Okay. All right. So like, I'll just talk about my experience. Okay. Where mm -hmm. I started, how I progressed this time was going by and et cetera. Uh, like I'll just be telling my story if it's okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think I started when I was 13. I cannot remember for sure. Mm -hmm. I used to take classes, uh, from my neighbor, you know, she mm -hmm. was a like teacher in public school nearby. Mm -hmm. And then I started learning the very first basic, the very basics of English with her, you know, mm -hmm. the alphabet, uh, like to be and et cetera. I don't remember for sure what that was, mm -hmm. but that's why I, I started. I was taking her classes for one year. And by that point, I've made enough progress and I had the foundation. I wouldn't say progress, you know, progress is not the word I can use here, but I, I knew what English is. I knew what learning a language is and I had the foundation. Uh, by that point, like I was already 14 to 15 and I needed to start taking it more seriously, you know, to start treating it more seriously because uh, I was closer to my like higher education. I needed to, ap to apply to universities, move on with my life. And I didn't want to be late. That's actually the trait I always had in myself. You know, I like doing things early. Like I'm a junior right now, for example, but I have already done an internship, right? As a sophomore in one of the big four companies in Deloitte, mm -hmm. like in Tampa. Wow. I rushed it. I ran, you know, mm -hmm. like I applied to internships for almost uh, 100 hours, but I didn't want to be late. Mm -hmm. Like I had that fear. What if I, for example, delay to my senior year? That means I'm not going to be able to get my return offer by the time I graduate, you know? I always had that trait. My parents, for example, never told, like, go ahead and start learning English, you know? I actually took the incentive. I was the first one to go and, like, discuss it with my parents. That's where I started. Uh, and then, like, okay, until the age of 15, it was all stable. Like, I, w I wasn't doing anything super, super exceptional, you know? Like, I was just learning grammar, not even English. Like, lang I mean, as a language, I was just learning grammar. Uh, I Okay, I, I used to learn new vocabulary, but it was a very wrong approach to language learning, you know? You, that's not how you learn a language. You learn a language from the outset by learning to listen to it, right? Mm -hmm. By learning to speak it, by learning to write it, by, and by learning to read it. But that was not the case. At that time, we didn't have those resources, right? We didn't have those experts, I mean, experts, that guidance. So, like... The teachers I took my classes from, they were very traditional, right? USSR teachers who prepare students for state tests, right? For where they basically have a bunch of grammar questions and they need to basically go through them. That's how I studied for the first two to three years. And guess what? I actually don't regret it. Yes, it was a wrong approach. Mm -hmm. If you look at it scientifically, right? Because that's not how you learn a language. But that gave me such a solid foundation of language that I just needed to develop skills in it now. By that point, I knew how to speak correctly, right? I knew how to write correctly, but I didn't know words, right? Uh, so when it comes to producing the language, I had grammar like done. I had a very, very good teacher. Like as a 15 or 16 year old, I studied the whole English grammar. And just because of that, I didn't have to study much for my SAT. The knowledge I got there was enough for my SAT writing as well, actually. Uh, and then like after that, I started learning language in its whole, you know, like uh, I started taking like IELTS classes. I was learning listening. I was learning, I was doing reading, right? I was doing writing, speaking. So developing all of those four skills uh, at the same time. It was so hard because I do remember uh, my first time coming to the educational center, to the test center and taking my mock exam. It was like, I was doing a placement test to see where I'm at. And the when the results came out, I was honestly shocked. It was a 3.5. Out of what? <laughs> out of nine 3.5 yeah nine. i took an ielts mock test oh, yeah they gave me they handed down that reading mm -hmm. test to me and that was something completely different you know i thought i have wasted two years of learning english because mm -hmm. at that point i scored a 3.5 <laughs> and my whole life in my eyes it started coming crumbling down you know i was like shit what what, what what is that like i was so shocked to be honest but then uh i realized that I should start taking it more seriously mm -hmm. because two years passed by, I thought I haven't made any progress. I have made progress, but I'm going to come back to it later, okay, mm -hmm. as I go on. Uh, so they placed me for a B1 group. Mm -hmm. uh, but at that time, I at that time, not only me, my teachers, they realized that I'm actually a very quick learner. I look at the, at the thing, right? And then I never forget it. I catch it, I remember it, I can use it. So I progress it from B1 to C1 only in a matter of a year. In one year, like I jumped from B1 to C1. I think it's it's not like super exceptional 
as of now, but at that mm -hmm. time, I don't know, it was something big, you know, mm -hmm. I was progressing really, really, really quick. Uh, and then I started getting my teacher support, guidance. After a short time, I took my first IELTS exam and it was a 7.5. But even though it was not like an epic score as of that time, because 7.5 was no longer a hype, right? People were getting eights, like uh, that was a hype, but 7.5 was not a hype. And I was hoping for an eight in my first attempt. It was uh, January of 2021. Uh, but the work I put into it, like only me, only me, myself, I know how hard I worked, you know? It was immediately after the lockdown. Uh, and during the lockdown, like all I was doing was studying. Yes, like I wasn't trying to devote my life to IELTS, right? But at that time, that was the task at hand. That was what I needed to get done. So I needed to approach it like seriously, differently. I used to wake up at 8 a.m. in the morning as a 15 or 16 or, okay, as a 15 or 16 year old boy, I was already planning my day ahead, you know? Like I do remember like writing my daily plan, printing it out and then hanging it up on my wall, you know, just trying to create that study spirit for myself. And I used to study for eight to nine hours a day. Like I used to organize Zoom sessions with my friend where we used to practice speaking because mm -hmm. at that time I almost did not know how to speak. I mean, I couldn't speak. I knew the language really well, but since I never practiced it, since I never tried to produce it, I couldn't speak it, you know? But during quarantine, I made that huge progress. And like once we went out of it, I took my first IELTS exam. It was a 7.5. Uh, time was passing by and we realized that, that like Cambridge is going to organize CPE, Cambridge Proficiency English sessions for the first time in our like uh, center, you know? Now what's, the, what's that? Is it like Cambridge IELTS? Proficiency English? Yeah. It is a proficient language proficiency exam too, but not like IELTS. IELTS is academic, right? Mm -hmm. It's for academic and for, it's for educational and professional purposes. Mm -hmm. But uh, Cambridge uh, Proficiency English is pure English, you know? It's testing you on your knowledge of English only. IELTS does not. Like, I think we are going to come back to it later. Okay, uh, sure, But sure. yeah, that's an interesting point, right? IELTS does it, not it, it test is. you only on it your is. language proficiency. Because I've never heard of that thing, CPI, yeah. you said, right? CPE? CPE. Yeah, Cambridge Proficiency English. It's admi it, it, like mm -hmm. administered by Cambridge, uh, not University Press, Cambridge Assessment English. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Like, feeling a little bit anxious after hearing how many followers you guys have. Uh, uh, yeah, but forget uh, about yeah. that, okay? <laughs> no one is watching us right now. Everyone is asleep. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, I know. Even I know. the guys behind the cameras they're falling asleep <laughs> all right so but it's, yeah it's listen it's just two of us here in this room and we are the only two people left in the, in this entire world okay of course so imagine this this is end of the world podcast that's what it is of course of end course, of the world you. podcast so we're the last two people remaining in this entire universe yeah that so helps <laughs> no no time restrictions no eyes watching us yeah, yeah that's what it is so we can just take it slow and enjoy right okay. no pressure no problem yeah. no problem okay i'll be like uh -huh. yeah all right so i i gave it a shot i took that exam and mm -hmm. guess what i passed it yes like i got okay basically the framework was divided into a b and c mm -hmm. okay if you are taking the c2 exam right mm -hmm. you can get c2 a that means like you got the highest c2 which is equivalent to a nine in IELTS. Mm -hmm. You can get a C2B, which is equivalent to an 8.5 in IELTS. They had the converter. Mm -hmm. Like you can put your score and it converts it to IELTS for you. All right, let me and ask then, you this real quick. Does, does even anyone need CPE? It, yeah, they need they it. They do. They need it. Yeah, okay, I actually well, well, used well, it for well, my college application. It uh -huh. helped me. Okay. Yeah, so I will, I will talk it, about it Yeah, too. they need it for university admission. For anything, it's a qualification, and it's actually a lifetime qualification. It doesn't expire. Okay, so unlike IELTS, yeah. which comes with only two-year validation, this has unlimited no expiration date. No expiration date. date. Yeah. Cool. Cool. It is cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but I wonder why local universities here and some international universities, none of the international universities for that matter, ask for a CPU CPE <laughs> certificate. They only ask IELTS. They do, but uh -huh. if you Okay, this is my best guess. I'm not sure, but uh -huh. I'm more sure than not sure. Uh -huh. If you look up the legislation part of it, you know, you can actually apply with uh, CAE, CPE, CFE, which is Cambridge first. I don't remember like, uh -huh. okay, like how they were called abbreviations. I don't remember them. Uh -huh. Okay. But I'm sure there is like Cambridge Advanced, CAE uh -huh. and CPE. Those are two exams I took. Okay. okay? From Cambridge itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure like they're actually accepted. Okay. By Uzbek universities. So if you are like applying to an Uzbek university and you need to prove 
I mean, to a state university and you need to prove your language proficiency, mm -hmm. you can submit those exams. You can submit your scores and they're going to be accepted. And like they are widely accepted by over 25,000 organizations, if I'm not mistaken, across the world. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Clearly, you've, you've, <laughs> done, you've done your research. <laughs> yeah, I have done your research. I mean, because, okay, I had to argue with a lot of people on it. You know, they were yeah. saying, what is that? It's not well recognized. Why did you even take that? So I needed to do some fact checking, you know, go to their website, see if those exams are really worth it. So mm -hmm. I've done the research for myself so that whenever someone asks me that question, mm -hmm. I can come up with a, you know, a factual answer uh -huh. that cannot be like it's, overthrown. But it's hard to beat <laughs> IELTS anyway. It's hard to beat IELTS. It is. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's like a brand. Now. Yeah, it is a brand. Yeah. It's uh, like trying to <laughs> try to go up against Apple. Exactly. You're a new phone manufacturer and you're going up against Apple. You're just going to get literally crushed, <laughs> especially in this climate of I Uzbekistan. Mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> this, yeah. With IELTS, yeah. it's become, I don't know, people started measuring success with IELTS, actually. A exactly. Okay. Exactly. They, they, <laughs> all right. That's, that's ridiculous. That's you know so what? Ridiculous. I was actually going to tell you something fun, but I'm not going to say it. Okay. Just go ahead. You know what? <laughs> like okay yesterday you were talking to bob uh -huh. and i wanted to bring this to the table today bob who's bob bob john my oh, friend <laughs> you call him, he called him bob yeah I, okay. I call him bob i'm gonna call okay, him okay i'm sorry if you're watching this because i promised yeah. him not to call him like that uh, I'm, call, I'm gonna call him bob when i meet him after this podcast okay he's gonna be happy trust me <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. but yeah uh, i was talking to bob john about it after uh -huh. yesterday's podcast like you told like students should not be aiming for a nine in IELTS, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to come and say, like, they actually should be fighting for it, you know? Uh -huh. They should be trying to get it. Okay. Because this is my experience. Okay, the part where I was talking about my language learning journey, it's self-explanatory, right? Everyone mm -hmm. learns it in the same way. They take private courses, they private like private tutoring classes, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they take those tests, they try it better the next time. I had the same experience, nothing mm -hmm. much different, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't want to dramatize it as if I'm a success story, I did something exceptional. No, I did not. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just a quick learner, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I was picking out, like, picking up that information really quick. Mm -hmm. And when I gave it a last shot, uh, I just got the score I needed. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all I want to tell about my language learning journey. But about... Oh, be uh, before you move on, uh, something else you left out is you're not just a guy who's a quick learner. You're also a guy with crazy work ethics. Yeah. Are you someone who wakes up every day, 8 o'clock in the morning, yep. plans their day and sticks to that plan, <laughs> follows yep. through with all their tasks during the day. That's what you call hard work, hard working guy. OK, so that's that's a big piece of the puzzle, you know, puzzle here. Yeah. That's a big that's yeah. that's a big yeah. piece. A lot that of people is, missing. Is. Exactly. Yeah. Like, you know, when it becomes something mm -hmm. natural, I think you are like that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I was just like basically observing how you work, you know, and etc. Mm -hmm. You are really hardworking too. And it's not like, you know, about being too attached to worldly things. Mm -hmm. No, we know it's temporary. Like temp it's not, I mean, we know it's not permanent, right? It's temporary. Like you do it for a certain time. Once you get the result, mm -hmm. like you're going to have a better work-life balance. Mm -hmm. But when you have the time pressure, when you need to get something done, you need to have enough determination mm -hmm. not to be ashamed of people, you know, when you mm -hmm. not get the result. Mm -hmm. Like that's how determined you should be. Mm -hmm. and that's what drives me. Like, honestly, I've been sacrificing my social life, like my time with friends and family for many years, I would say, starting from my teenage years until now. But I'm sure that at a certain point, of life once i'm done with this whole path you know i set for myself it's gonna end soon i know like i have planned everything out thoroughly like your plans will never work mm -hmm. will never work but the outcome will be just like you wanted you know if you work hard like enough for it mm -hmm. i know that i can like get back to my social life i can get back to my family care for them and etc but like when i have that responsibility when i need to get it done do you remember what you said in the beginning we rush Mm -hmm. We want to get it instantly. And that feeling, that urge, basically, like, you know, makes you addicted to working. You become a workaholic. That's all you see. That's all mm -hmm. you want. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we were discussing IELTS, right? Sorry for going slightly off topic. I mm -hmm. really wanted to stop there and right. express yeah. myself. You, you, please, yeah. please, feel yeah, free. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah. telling you. But yeah. There, there are no rules here. Only <laughs> rules are there are no rules. Of course. Of <laughs> course. Free. Yeah, that is good. That is good. But why students should be aiming for a nine in IELTS? Okay, you have more life experience than me, for sure. You are mm. much more mature. You saw, like, much more. You already graduated from university, right? Like, you lived away from your parents. But, like, despite that, there is something I disagree with you, like, 
uh, especially, I mean, in terms of IELTS. Mm -hmm. Okay, you told nine should not be the end goal. It's mm -hmm. nothing, right? That's what you approximately said. I don't remember for sure what you said, mm -hmm. but that's the point you were trying to make. That's incorrect. That's what I hear all experts saying all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't want to mention their names, but like, because there are a lot of them. They are basically putting themselves out there and saying, okay, students should get a seven, 7.5, eight and move on. But we know that everything starts with discipline, right? Mm -hmm. That's how students learn. Mm -hmm. I'm a student, I have a student mindset and I, mm -hmm. I know this for sure. If I start using ChatGPT for an assignment I need to get done, right? Mm -hmm. I will get addicted to it. If I miss a lecture once, I will keep missing it like until I graduate because that's gonna turn into a habit. The same with IELTS. If students just get the score, they have the potential for, they have the capacity for, and leave it there, they are gonna be embracing basically, you know, and applying the same philosophy mm -hmm. to how they approach things as they go on. Mm -hmm. So like trying to get a nine, okay, even if not getting, trying to get a nine in IELTS is actually a really, really good philosophy. Maybe as I told before, it is a matter of personality, but I don't think it is. Like in this regard in particular, our brains are intertwined the same. We get used to easy things, right? So if they like learn to challenge themselves from the outset, maybe IELTS is the first thing they are doing ever in their lives. Yes, they don't need it like 7.5, 7, it's enough. But if they have the potential capacity for a higher score, why, why would they need to move on? They can like try themselves out, right? Work really hard for it, get a nine and then move on. Once they embrace that philosophy, once they learn to be the first, the best at everything they do, you know, they're going to keep up at the same pace as they go on. But like, if they get used to being the second, the third, basically not the best at what they do, that's the philosophy they're going to be embracing as they go on, you know? So I would say like getting a nine, trying to get a nine. I mean, if not, even if not getting, it's not like easy, right? It must be I mean, it might be too time consuming, but at least trying, you know, giving it a try if they have resources and time is actually a really good strategy. That's what students should be doing. Uh, I agree. I actually said this exact thing on one of my podcasts in the past with IDP, not my own podcast here. So uh, in short, what I said was the way you do small things is the way you do everything else in life. Yes. The way you do small things is the way you do everything else in life. If you are excellent in learning English, chances are you're going to be <laughs> excellent in whatever else you move yes, on to. exactly. So it's really about that behavioral pattern. Like you, you yeah. see that pattern, right? If you're yeah. disciplined and hardworking when learning a language, chances are you're going to be that guy when you go into accounting, when you go into IT or when you, whatever you know project you take up yes i wholeheartedly agree and and i honestly actually never say to a student you should not aim for a 9 what here's what i tell them instead i i ask them if they actually want a band 9 mm. i do i ask them a few times i said do you really want a band 9 all right and yeah. i don't ask them why I don't ask them the why question. I ask them, do you really want a band nine? Do you really want to get the top score? Do you really want to excel? That's the question I ask them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, and they that say, yeah, sense. oh, yeah, I do. And I say, and then I repeat myself, are you sure? Is that something you want? And then they confirm that. Yeah, I do want that. Hmm. Then what I tell them is, okay, I can help you get a band nine, but you have to do exactly what I tell you. And you have to be exactly the guy I want you to be. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? And then oh. they pause. So oh. they think, oh, hold on a second. <laughs> I'm not sure if I, I'm not, I'm not sure if I can do that. Yeah. yeah. The, the, I don't think students can get a band nine. I genuinely believe they can. They can. What I, what yeah. I think is they're not ready or willing to do the work that it takes to get there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So at least trying, mm -hmm. you know, Instructors should not be demotivating their students mm -hmm. saying, hey, like, why are mm -hmm. you keeping, like, why are you moving on? Better study for your SAT. Okay, if students have time and resources, why not give them mm -hmm. a chance, okay? Help that kid out, guide him. If Absolutely. that's what he wants. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead and that's do it. That's what I'm telling them. I'm telling them we're always after the highest. Exactly. We're, we're aiming for the highest. Yes, yes, right? yes. But sometimes I, I have to make sure that <coughs> Chase, uh, Chase, 
after the top score doesn't turn into a maniacal obsession. You understand? That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. It does not I know tur- what you're t- t- about. turn into a mani- maniacal obsession yeah. like it's become these days. Yeah. To the point where everything else becomes afterthought, to the point where everything else is secondary. Yeah. Their SATs, their uh, university yeah. admission, they're, they're, they're about to graduate high school <clears throat> and they need to get their extracurriculars done. They got their SATs waiting, right? Yeah. But they got 7.5. Guess what they do? They come in tell me, I want to do IELTS again. Why? Because I want an 8. I'm not mm-hmm. happy with the 7.5. What do you need an 8 for? Is that even a university yes. requirement? And they yes. say, no, I'm just not happy with my band <laughs> score. That's what I mean by obsession, maniacal yes, obsession. Yes, yes. become To the point they've become delusional, mm-hmm. right? To the point they're not rational anymore. They are not wisely spending their resources, their time and money, Right, yeah. and, and and your friend Mr. Bob made a really good point, saying you're better off doing your SATs with that time and money. You're better off going getting some expert advice, right? Writing, doing some projects like passion projects, right? Yeah, 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 yep, yep, yep. yeah. Like they, if they, that's the case, they, that's they right. They kind of become the case, they are blind right. to all these things, right? Yeah, they become blinded by this IELTS hype mania. Yes, yes craze. Yes. That's what they call yeah, right. it. But but I know it's a fad. It's going to go away soon, right? Because yeah. because what's happening right now, I see this thing, intellectual change happening in this uh, city, in Uzbekistan, right? The bar is going up and IELTS 9 is no longer considered a success. And that yeah. side, uh, that's as far as I'm concerned, there's a change for, for the better, right? Because yeah. now students are aiming for other things. They're, they're focusing on versatility, right? Having different set of skills, not only being good at one thing, like English, yeah. they they're learning that it's important not only be able to speak English but also be critical thinker, be able yeah. to uh, be able to do stand up speaking, talk in public, coordinate with people, right? Work on their you know CV, yeah. right? Bun- bunch yeah. of other things. Exactly. Right. Exactly. You're right. Uh, okay. If that's the case, mm-hmm. you're right. Uh, but that's that's why I explicitly mentioned if they have time and resources. Mm-hmm. But if they are like uh, college applicants, you know, applying to universities and mm-hmm. etc., then like mm-hmm. that's where prioritizing comes from. I mean, ca- that's where prioritizing comes. Mm-hmm. Like they should prioritize things. Do I need IELTS? Do I really need mm-hmm. it? If they're not meeting the benchmark, you know, if they're not meeting the threshold, I would say, mm-hmm. uh, then yes, they should go ahead and retake it, right? But if they can use their time, resources more wisely, Mm -hmm. it's better for them to study and get a higher score in SAT because that's where your competition is measured. Without a language proficiency, without submitting a language proficiency test, they cannot open the doors to education. They cannot get into the university. It's just, this is how you look at it. IELTS is a key. You open the door with it. And then like you need to decorate it inside, right? How do you decorate it with your essays, like mm-hmm. with your SAT, with the APs, like extracurricular activities mm-hmm. and with personal uh, points of excellence of mm-hmm. you as a person, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, in that regard, I agree. And I wanted to make one more point about IELTS, like because most, most people, you know, recently they have started questioning me saying, hey, like, is it really helping you in the US? Mm-hmm. Like, I think you are interested in that question too, right? For sure, for sure. Like, because I'm you would interested obviously in everything. say it obviously is not helping you yeah. just because like everyone speaks English there, mm-hmm. right? But um, this is what I noticed. It. So like my whole sophomore year has been about hunting for internships, you know, mm-hmm. uh, looking for job prospects. Mm-hmm. What am I, what am I going to do after I graduate? Mm-hmm. Will I go straight back to school mm-hmm. or will I take some time, a gap in between you know, like get funding for myself and then go back to school for my master's degree. So I've been hunting for jobs, going to career fairs, and actually uh, I got an internship offer from PwC. Like I will explain like what Congrats. it is later. Cool. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this is what I noticed. When I used to approach employers, right, I need to make a pitch, mm-hmm. a one minute pitch mm-hmm. explaining who I am. Mm-hmm. That's where I need to stand out. Within that one minute, I need to put all the information you know, everything about myself mm-hmm. that like distinguishes me from other applicants they can take, right? Mm-hmm. Because competition there is huge. The market is saturated, right? Mm-hmm. Like the job market is saturated. Mm-hmm. There are millions and millions of college graduates, fresh graduates, like hunting for jobs and they need to make sure they are picking the best ones. Uh, and when I was doing my pitch, I did this experiment, right? Like to a couple of employers, one of them was PwC actually, I told, and then mm-hmm. uh, I scored 
and nine on a test called IELTS. Mm -hmm. They stopped me. That the first question they asked was, "What is IELTS?" Mm -hmm. And then I started explaining it to them. It's an academic and like uh, language test. I didn't say academic. Like honestly, it was not a lie. I didn't lie because general uh, general IELTS tests professional English, right? I said it's an academic and professional a language qualification for international students or for international workers who want to go to other countries and like you know do their thing there. So uh, then they told, "How did you get the highest score?" And what does it mean to you? I told, okay, it doesn't mean I know English better than anyone else, but it means that I've got, you know, the skills, communication that it takes in a professional environment. I can write very well, right? I can write good rep reports, memos, uh, and any written work that it like takes to do in the office, right? I told if it's about negotiations, talking to clients, talking to colleagues in the most professional ways possible, I can do it too. That's what like my score in the test shows. And they were like, wow, that's impressive. Like I talked about other achievements I have in college, right? I'm, for example, part of the e-board in like the largest student organization, investment club, where we do different like investment projects and et cetera, manage the fund of university. I mentioned those things, but for some reason they stopped at that just because that's something they don't understand, right? They asked me explicitly what is IELTS and I had to explain what it is. And I think that's something that like, you know, grabbed their attention, uh, that made them remember who I am. Uh, and even after experimenting, you know, not after experimenting, after I really went and did my internship, like I, I just started it, like we had some placement programs, right? You go there, you talk to your colleagues, like everyone introduces you to each other. And then for a couple of days, they assign you certain tasks. While doing those things, I realized like the knowledge, not the knowledge, the skills I got from IELTS are helping me, especially mm -hmm. writing. Mm -hmm. When you go to college, you take composition classes, right? They are supposed to teach you how to write. But if I did not have that foundation before I went to college, I wouldn't manage it. Okay? So... As an academic test that opens you the doors to higher education and then uh, to career, right? What I studied in IELTS has always been there for me, helping me get it, to get A's, for example, mm -hmm. have good relationships with my, with my professors because I write really well, right? Just an example. And land good internships just because I have what they need most like in the business industry, communication. So yeah, I believe it helped me in those regards actually. Like even when I was in the US. After watching this podcast, all students are gonna get fired up about IELTS again. <laughs> I hope <laughs> this so. Is, this guy is restarting the IELTS craze, restarting yeah, yeah, the IELTS yeah. mania. I'm not I, trying, yeah, I'm yeah. not trying to popularize it because yeah. as you told, I actually, I, I actually don't like to, like people, you know, uh, people making it an indicator of success. That's mm. a wrong thing. Like that's not mm. how it should be, but we need to basically, like work around the misconceptions that exist out there. What mm -hmm. is it? Like, why are we taking it? And et cetera. Questions that are being answered by people in the same ways, in monotonous ways. So I know like uh, not the whole Uzbekistan is going to watch me, but I hope at least people who are watching me, right, they will clear up those misconceptions for themselves mm -hmm. and have a clearer understanding of what why they need to take this test mm -hmm. and why they need to like try to yeah. perform well. And understand that it's not so much about the test itself, it's more about how you go about it. It's yeah. your approach to it. Yeah. It's your mindset about it. It's your exactly. attitude towards your your exam. It's, just, it's really about that, not yes. really the test itself or what it stands for or what it means to other people out there. It, it's about the skills and the qualities, the traits you develop uh, along the way. That's, yeah. that's what it's yeah, 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 yeah. about. That's really. what I wanted to say. You like yeah. It was really short and sweet. Yeah. And so as someone who's got the top score in IELTS, would you like to share with our audience some useful tips for different modules of IELTS, reading, listening, speaking, writing? So how did you improve uh, your reading, listening, writing, speaking skills? Okay. Um, okay, I will start with writing, okay? Because mm -hmm. that was the weakest point of mine. Uh -huh. And this is what I did. And it actually really, really helped me. There is a book called... Uh, like that's the book I started with complete aisles 4.5 and 5 I'm, if I'm not mistaken then from 5 to 6.5 and then from 6.5 to 7.5 right like that's the okay if anyone is looking 
uh, for writing samples, for the best writing out there, you need to check out those resources, right? Like uh, Farhat and all like other non-authentic resources, they are not gonna help students get a high score because I noticed people dramatize, right? They say, hey, like if you do this in your writing, then eight is guaranteed. <laughs> That's really <laughs> dumb because there is something called standard oh, yes. English conventions, uh -huh. right? How we usually write things. Mm -hmm. uh, a formal essay, you started with the introduction, then you write main ideas, mm -hmm. like also called body paragraphs, right? And then you end it with a conclusion. If you're following that framework, if your writing is smooth, if you are answering all parts of the question, right? If you are covering all parts of the question as needed, if you have like decent grammar, you know, not monotonous, like grammar that's helping your cohesion and coherence as well, you should be fine. Uh, so like this is how I improved my writing. You know, I have a I have a tendency to go out of topic while I'm talking. No, 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 you, you because are very, do you very... remember I told I'm really thoughtful. Uh -huh. I get, you know, a splash of thoughts at the same uh -huh. time. And then I need to somehow spread them out and put all of them into shape. And so yeah. Yeah, and that's what makes this episode extra special. I'm <laughs> loving it, guys. Yeah. I don't know you, but it's it's great. Yeah, thank you. I'm, yeah, thank I'm you. enjoying every moment of it. Okay. Me too. Yeah, like, like I said, all right, this is your show, this is your episode. <laughs> Yeah, have it of course. however you like. Of course, yeah. But okay, uh, going back to the topic, this mm -hmm. is how I improved my writing. I heard someone talking to me about the method Benjamin Franklin used mm -hmm. to learn something. He used to reflect, not copy, reflect. He used to read, for example, let's say five pages, right? He used to reread it for five to six times in a row. And then he used to close the book and reproduce the same work by himself. This is what I did too. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, like if you practice with Cambridge books, right? They've got the samples in the end of the book. They've got the samples. I would pick up the samples with the highest scores. I will read those essays, right? Do the analysis for myself, read the examiner's feedback. Then I would close the book after reading it for five to six times. I would remember everything out there, right? And then I tried to reproduce the same work. It was not copying. It was remembering mm -hmm. and copying it from my mind, like mm -hmm. putting it into the paper, you know? Mm -hmm. And I would say it actually really, really helped me. I wouldn't call it shadowing, but it's something like shadowing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I recommend like students to do for writing. That's not the only thing they should be doing. It really depends on what they struggle with, right? I used to struggle with writing overall, so that's what I used to do. But there are students who struggle with coherence, for example. They have a tendency to overuse linking words or to underuse them. But you know what? Sorry for yeah. cutting you sure, short here. Home. This technique memorization you're using, it's, it's kind of a one-size-fits-all answer to your writing problem. And yeah. here's why. So when you memorize text and reproduce it, you're actually working on all aspects of your writing, grammar, vocabulary, yeah. cohesion, and coherence. It's like killing four birds with one stone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It really is. And which is what we actually do here to help students develop their speaking skills as well. Because when oh. we know when we teach them grammar, vocabulary in you know separately as separate units. They're going to have a hard time mixing them together. So what we do instead is we get them to memorize a dialogue or an answer and reproduce verbally, right? Yeah. Hoping that, hoping that they eventually, they, 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 they gradually develop a sense of grammar and vocabulary, mm. right? This is, this is more, more of a natural way to yeah. internalize yeah, language yeah, yeah, as yeah, opposed yeah. to learning them. On, you know, in isolation, in isolation, that's the term the experts use. I actually learned it from one of the <laughs> people I had on, on the podcast. Yeah, and when okay. you learn grammar and vocabulary in isolation, but when you learn a text or dialogue and reproduce it word for word, right, you're, you're ticking all those boxes, exactly. grammar, vocabulary. Exactly. So you never have to worry about your coherence and cohesion. Yeah. And when you start producing your own work, it just comes out natural intuitively yeah, exactly right? i guess that's how yeah. it works so yeah it was a really good strategy actually mm -hmm. like yeah especially you know it's especially good for people who are mm -hmm. suffering from a low score mm -hmm. suffering from a low, low score you might say like it is a wrong word to say but no mm -hmm. i literally mean it suffering from a low score people mm -hmm. who cannot for example get from a 5.5 to a 6.5 you know mm -hmm. for decades they've mm -hmm. been trying so hard they've been working so like they've been like, you know, wanting it so like desperately so mm -hmm. bad, but they still cannot get it. For, for people like that, this technique works really well. But once you're at seven, right? Once you're at seven and need to, to jump to an eight, 
that's where the biggest, biggest puzzle starts uncovering. That's where you need to approach things differently. And this is what I did. You really need to be getting feedback from as many people as you can, right? They don't need to be IELTS experts. They read your essay and they should tell you like their genuine opinion. I understood it easily. It was really smooth, right? I really like it. It is, it is professional. It is a good essay overall. So once you get like those opinions from people, you go ahead, like you go back, you read all the feedback, you have to write it down. You read all the feedback. What is the most frequent pattern I had? Most people told it's not like smooth, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't read smooth. So that means I need to work on my coherence and cohesion. Mm -hmm. And then you go ahead, you take the best skills for writing from Cambridge University Press, the most authentic resource I know that exists out there, or Advantage Writing Skills, which is also a good resource. And you basically flick through pages that teach you coherence and cohesion. So you basically, once you're at seven in writing in particular, right, and want to jump to an eight, you need to be approaching things very objectively, like very professionally, making sure you know where your flaws are and feeling, correcting those flaws, you know, like becoming flawless. Uh, that's what I would recommend for writing. Uh, for speaking, like, okay, I took the exam only three times in my whole life. The first score 7.5. The second one, I took it with a five months ga gap. Like I scored an eight. Mm -hmm. That's the score I used for my college applications, actually, the eight I got. And then like I took it recently, four months ago, and I scored a nine. You are the, I think you're the only niner who got nine in three attempts. Yeah. You are yeah. the only actually, niner I am. who did it in the, uh, in the fewest number of, attempts yeah that, that's that's a that's whole also one 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 parameter thank you for it, mentioning it, it, it is, actually it is yeah. it is because it took me let me it's like 10 attempts 10 attempts i did wow. it in 10 attempts mm. i got my first nine in 10 attempts so first attempt was 6.5 and then 7.5 wow. and then eight and another another eight and then i had <laughs> consecutive 8.5s and then finally nine Wow, it's yeah. been a long journey, right? For you, it's yeah. been a long journey. But you see, you have that mindset. You, ha you worked for it. You knew you don't need it, but you worked for it just because uh -huh. you wanted to get it done. That's yeah. really good. Like I actually respect it, to be honest. Oh, thanks. But yeah, uh, I was talking about speaking, right? This is what I realized, you know, mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali? I actually wanted to discuss it with you. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think it's going to be an interesting point for students. Like in speaking, you should be becoming human. I mean, mm -hmm. you should be behaving human, you know? Mm -hmm. What do I mean by this? Like when you talk like a robot in your speaking, you know, it sounds like you memorized it mm -hmm. as if it's a memorized framework speech, you know. But when you are natural, when you sometimes make mistakes, you know, but you are fluent, you are having a conversation with the examiner, you are answering his questions in the most natural ways possible. That's how you get a like high score. Because, okay, in my previous exam, right, like when I received it an eight, like literally three years ago, my speaking score was a 7.5. I do remember what I did there, right? Like I was talking too formal. I was trying to flex, brag mm -hmm. with my vocab, for example, with my grammar, right? I was trying to use inversion in my speech. I used to like mm -hmm. use words that did not fit the con like fit into the context at all. While when I was, when I got my nine, right? Like four months ago, I was behaving really, really natural. Like I came back from the US. I know how native speakers behave, right? How they talk and et cetera. So I was behaving natural. Yes, I was answering questions. I was explaining them fully. Uh, I wasn't searching for words because I knew how to express myself. I knew what I have to say to like explain my position on certain things. And that's how I got a nine. So this is actually, I think this is a good point because, okay, this is like what's still happening in Uzbekistan, right? Instructors are printing out like 300, 400 long word lists for their students saying, hey, like learn these words, learn these idioms and try to use them in your speaking. That's a wrong approach. Like, I know you guys don't do that. Most other professional, like, instructors don't do that. But, like, this is what's happening, like, in Uzbekistan, you know, especially by very traditional teachers. Uh, this is a wrong approach, like, because uh, learning 500 to 600 words and then, you know, using them deliberately but not naturally in your speech, in your written work, those things lower your score. Because that's out of context. Yes, you need to learn those words. I'm not saying don't learn vocabulary. Learn vocabulary so that when you are talking, you don't stop for two minutes searching for a word so that there is a word that comes to your mind and you can express yourself more freely. Uh, yeah, that's what I would recommend for speaking to students, like just be natural, okay? Mm -hmm. Don't try to show off because by showing off, you might be telling things that do not fit into the context, that don't sound natural, mm -hmm. right? And that brings down your score. 
uh, for vocabulary because you are using words that do not fit into the context, right? And for fluency, maybe like just because you are not being a good speaker, you are not being fluent. Uh, and to improve my speaking, what did I do? Uh, I think like when it comes to speaking, you cannot really learn it by reading, right? Or by listening. Actually, you can learn it by listening and speaking. How can you learn it by listening? L okay, everyone has got a different personality, but I'm a type of person who can reflect. If I listen to someone speaking a certain way, the next day I can adopt the same thing and speak the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, like from the first attempt without trying to shadow that person first. All right, let's try yeah, this. Yeah, I just catch it. Let's try this. I'm going to say something, a couple of lines, and, <laughs> okay. I need you, and I need you no, to mimic I, me. Okay, if it's memorizing, like I'm not going to do that. But if it's like accent, pronunciation, uh, speaking sure, in general, Sure, sure, sure. I'm going to yeah. say something. Okay, I'm going to read the line. Okay. Uh, when I was in college, I was one of the smartest guys. When I was in college, I was one of the smartest guys. Okay, sort of, but not exactly. But <laughs> not, you see, it's similar. You know, I can it's, catch it. It's okay. Let's try another line. And you guys, guys behind the camera, you guys tell us if if he got gets it right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Let me try this again. Uh, uh, this morning, what did I do? I don't remember what I did this morning. All right. This morning. I got up pretty late and then I took a shower and I came straight to work. This morning, I woke pretty late. I mean, I woke up pretty late. I took a shower and then I came here. You <laughs> see? I mean, okay, not exactly. <laughs> no, but not look, exactly. this is not what I meant. They're like, no. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> look, uh, this is not what I exactly meant, right? Yeah. Uh, look, when people speak, they've mm -hmm. got like different approaches, right? Everyone mm -hmm. speaks. You speak this like a different way. Mm -hmm. I speak in a different way, right? Yeah. Accents, mm -hmm. how people explain things and etc. I meant shadowing in general, like not mm -hmm. using the same pronunciation, you know, not using the same facial expressions. But if I used to watch a TED Talk, TED Talk speaker, like, mm -hmm. you know, speaking a certain way, mm -hmm. I can adopt it the next mm -hmm. day. Some people, for example, uh, think while they speak, right? So mm -hmm. they speak slower. slower. While other people do not. In that regard, I can basically imitate them, mm -hmm. right? Imitate is a good word. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would say you can actually s learn to speak mm -hmm. by listening. Yeah. If you have a personality where you can reflect on mm -hmm. things and learn from them. Uh, another thing I did was to constantly, to surround myself with English. Like this actually really helps you, you know? When you start thinking in English, right? Even when you are counting, you count in English. When you are talking to yourself in your mind, you do it in English. Mm -hmm. You read English. You mm -hmm. listen English. Mm -hmm. Even when you are listening to lectures, right? Mm -hmm. Like on anything that interests you, be it religion, uh, be it fashion, mm -hmm. be it cooking, mm -hmm. whatever, be it lifestyle, right? When you listen to those things in English, mm -hmm. when you read those things in English, when you are talking to yourself in your mind, you talk to yourself in English, and you basically like surround yourself with that thing, like you start becoming more fluent, right? Because your mind starts thinking in English and you do not need to have, I mean, you do not need to take time to convert the translation from Uzbek to English to actual speech, to mm -hmm. reproduce it, right? That process takes time. That's why most people are not fluent. That's why most students cannot become fluent. Just because they have not, have not ado adopted that philosophy where they need to be surrounding themselves with the language, you know, everywhere they go and that everything they do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that really, really helped me with my speaking. For listening and reading, uh, I genuinely would recommend students to practice as much as they can. Mm -hmm. Not with reading, with listening, they need to practice as much as they can because, okay, if they have been listening to English songs, their problem is not speed. Like IELTS recordings, they are not fast. It's easy to understand. For a B1 learner, it's easy to understand, right? They understand what's going on. Yeah, they might not understand all words, but they understand what's going on. They understand the conversation, right? So in that regard, they don't need to practice, for example, listening to rap. This is what some people recommend, and I disagree, actually, right? They need to be improving their techniques. What is IELTS listening testing them on? That's the first question, on their academic skills. Note-taking, right? Uh, listening to a lecture and picking up the information they need. Because... Do you, like, do you know what happens in part three? Of course you do. You are an instructor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there is a professor and two students, right? Mm -hmm. A dialogue mm -hmm. taking place between three people, right? And then everyone talks. You need to listen and pick a choice that is the right one. What do you do as a student? You face similar situations. You go to see your professor with your friends, right? You face a similar situation. You need to make choices. You need to be able to articulate, to listen carefully. That's what IELTS is teaching you. 
That's what it is testing you on. It just wants to see if you are ready enough to handle, you know, different situations when you become a college student elsewhere abroad, like in a place where your education is like conducted in, in an English medium environment. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, that's why I would recommend them to just practice with listening, just practice, reflect on your mistakes, see where your like problems are taking place. If it's spelling, practice spelling with multiple choice like learn to listen carefully and avoid distractors, right? That's how you can improve your listening. With reading, though, I wouldn't say just practice. Most parts of reading in IELTS are about comprehension, right? Uh, not true, false, not given. For true, false, not given, you can prove 90% of your answer. I, I know a synonym for this word. I know a synonym for this word. I know these words are somehow interconnected between each other. So I know the answer is true. Like if you, for example, cannot find uh, I, I call it a root word, right? In a question. If you cannot find a root word in the sentence, in the passage, that means like it's not given. If it's not there, it's not given. If it's opposite of it, it's false. Like mm -hmm. if it if it this if it's the same thing, reproduce it in a different way, then it's true. Yeah, there are certain aspects of IELTS reading that you can improve by practice too. But there are there is a lot about comprehension too. Like, I don't know if you heard about it, by but for passage one, you are supposed to spend 12 minutes only. For passage two, you spent like around 20 minutes, right? So you've got, you've already spent 32 minutes. And then for passage three, you spend around 23 to 24 minutes. And the rest of the time you use it for basically like putting things in your answer sheet. That's what Cambridge experts recommend on their website, if I'm not mistaken, but that's how things should be in general. Or else I read it in complete 6.5 to 7.5, like in one of those two resources. And I actually think that's right. Why they are sparing more time for passage two and passage three? Because those passages are more about comprehension. Yes, no, not given questions, for example, right? They test your comprehension, multiple choice. Like you read the whole text, you don't need to find proof. You need to read the whole text, draw connections, and find what the main idea is. What is the text about? When you are doing headings, it's the same thing, right? How do you improve your comprehension? Not by practicing, for sure. You improve your comprehension by reading. What is the genre of IELTS passages? It's mostly science, right? So students should be going ahead and reading not super science books, but books about science, like free economics, outliers, all, all those self-help books are actually a good choice. They can read those and improve, right? So you encourage them to do some extra reading on top of their assignments. Not extra reading, they should actually prioritize school. reading, not practicing. They mm -hmm. should prioritize reading. Mm -hmm. Instead of practice, okay, instead of practicing for five hours, they can read for four hours and then practice for one hour. That's gonna be much more helpful. Mm -hmm like my own experience and I could actually like analyze it for you, you know, break it down for you, mm -hmm. even though it was like, yeah, but I tried to break it down as much as I can, you know, to make sure students understand what I mean. Yeah. 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 It's, it is very clear. Yeah. So that's like the advice I would give. Um, that, and yeah, that's a lot of great advice. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. I tr try my best, you know, to give back, to uh -huh. basically help out like uh -huh. everyone watching our episode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that's all I wanted to say about it. Are you going to be taking the IELTS test again? No. Why would I need it? Exactly. Why you would need it? Yeah. That's a good point. I'm glad you moved on. I'm glad <laughs> yeah. this chapter is over yeah. for Mr. Sokhrov. And, and you know why I took it, actually? Okay. Um, as I told you in the mm. beginning... I'm a type of person who likes to get things done the way I expected initially. Mm -hmm. When I started studying for IELTS and got my first 3.5 on the mock test, I had the desire inside myself to get a nine, you know, mm -hmm. at a certain point in my life to get a nine. Yeah, that turned to, into a life goal, into a dream. And eventually I'm glad I moved on with my education, you know, with things that matter more, like with my career. I didn't want to, for, for some people, IELTS is a career, career. it's nice, mm -hmm. but like, uh, since I had other plans, I couldn't make it a career for myself and fully devote myself to it, right? I, I had to move on. But after, even after moving on, I went to college and I see like you, Bigzot Mirahmedev, and all others, not all others, you two getting mm -hmm. like the first nines in Uzbekistan, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, these guys are monsters. Like I honestly was genuinely happy and genuinely and in a positive sense, in a positive note, jealous okay. of what you got. Like I'm not, I, I don't know about the other guy, but I look nothing like a monster, guys. Come here. I mean, look <laughs> at me. I'm so skinny. Yeah. No, no, no not in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm so skinny. Please get, get, get this guy some food, please. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Oh, yeah. 
this is this t-shirt is this is t- this t-shirt is m and it's still big for me that's medium-sized t-shirt and that's still big for me the same problem yeah. like honestly i've always suffered from it i don't know how to cope but yeah. we'll talk about I, it after the I, podcast no we monster, gotta solve okay. it definitely I don't, know the, I don't know what you guys think of the other guy but <laughs> i'm no monster okay <laughs> Yeah, I'm a very nice guy. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Or at least I'd like you to think that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, I saw that pattern, you know, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Look, I had this goal, I had this dream. Why did I leave it? Mm-hmm. Okay, I got into university, right? I'm studying already. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm getting everything done. Like, I'm trying to mm-hmm. take care of the next few years mm-hmm. of the next, like, you know." Uh, flow of how, my, of how my life is gonna go, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the course of my life. I remember the word now. But like, I still had that urge. I need to come back at a certain point, mm. try to get that line, you know? Yeah. So winter of this year was that chance. Like in summer when I came last year, I was really, really busy with my summer classes. I took three really hard classes, so I had no time to take exams, to go out, and etc. Mm-hmm. I was basically studying the whole day. Mm-hmm. Like I never re- realized that those course, courses were so hard. It was literally a four months program, you know, compress it into a two months program. And yet at the same time, it's challenging. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't take it in summer. The winter I was coming this time, I basically talked to my instructor, told like, hey, like, can you give me a free seat? I don't want to pay for it, to mm-hmm. be honest. Like I can't <laughs> afford it and etc. cetera. Uh, so like, he actually gave me a free seat. Mm-hmm. Uh, I took the exam. I gave it a shot, right? Uh, I mean, the center paid for me. Uh-huh. Uh, and then, like, yeah, I finally got it. Mm-hmm. Actually, after going out of my exam, I was confident that I, I did it. You know, like, mm-hmm. in reading, I was sure I got all questions right. Mm-hmm. And I even, like, dared to find a mistake in mm-hmm. the passage. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to, like, reach out to them about that, like, mistake. But there was a grammatical mistake right, like, inside mm-hmm. the passage. Uh, in listening, I was sure I got all of them right. Writing, I felt super confident just because I was a college student, right? I've been writing for two years, professional reports, academic papers. So IELTS writing should not be a big deal for me anymore, right? In speaking, I wasn't very confident just because I thought like I behaved too informal. But then like I analyzed it after a couple of days, after I recovered, it, right? I wasn't behaving too informal. I was just like really, really natural, Natural as I have never been in my IELTS speaking exams, you know? Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, I'm going to receive, I'm going to get at least an 8.5. It's going to be at least an 8.5. In the worst, worst, worst case scenario, it's going to be an 8. But then like it turned out to be what I wanted. And that's the only reason I actually took it. To make sure like, you know, I'm not going away with the childhood desire dream I had inside like of Mm -hmm. me. I needed to somehow clear it up and then move on. Mm -hmm. So I came back to it for a moment. I took it and then I'm moving like on right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you fulfilled that desire. Yeah. You can finally move on. Yeah. I'm glad you can finally move on. That's good. Uh, That, (laughs) I don't know how to react to that, honestly. Why? Yeah. Cause if, I don't know, I don't know if I would do the same thing if I were you, because you got into an American university, right? You, You got, you got a lot going for you in the, in the US. Yeah. You could have stayed there. You could have got a job, right? You could yeah. have made, you know, you could, yeah, right. you could have made a lot of money just staying there working the entire summer or your winter break, which yeah. is what my brother is doing. Mm-hmm. And I, I sometimes ask my brother if he wants to take the ILTS test. He does show some, and he did show some interest. He did say he'd like to retake it once again, but he's not interested in getting okay. a nine. Yeah. All right. But, um, but you guys got to get over it. Come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we did a lot of talking about IELTS. What do you say we talk a little about SAT as well? Sure, no so, problem. Uh, can you share your SAT score real quick? You got... I got a 1520 two fif- years ago. 1520. That's still impressive. That puts you in 98th percentile, yeah, yeah. right? Right now. It was a 99th percentile at that time. Uh, but ba- right now, now it's, it's yeah. 98th, right? <laughs> the bar is yeah. going up. It should be. Yeah. It is going up. The average yeah. scores are rising. Yeah. I can actually, okay, before you want to ask me questions about SAT, right? uh, yeah. can I share something very quick? Please, backstory, like, yes. Okay, <clears throat> the SAT right now, tests cannot get easier, right? Mm-hmm. That would make them invalid. Mm-hmm. To stay valid, to stay credible, tests should maintain the same standards and the same level of difficulty. Mm-hmm. But SAT right now is easier mm-hmm. because it's become DSAT. Especially in terms of English, math is the same. It's like as easy or as hard as it was, mm. as it has always been. Nothing has changed. But with English, you know, like I tried 
practicing recently and I scored an 800 out of 800. This is what happens. Passages are small, right? You read one passage and then you need to answer a question about that passage only. When I was taking it, when the test was still paper-based, like we were exposed to, I think four, yeah, four long passages, you know, you had to read long passages with 13 questions each. That was really exhausting. That was mm -hmm. really hard. Mm -hmm. That was true SAT, you know, that would mm -hmm. basically carry you away, <laughs> exhaust you. Mm -hmm. But right now, SAT has become much easier. And that's the sole reason, not the sole reason. That's one of the primary reasons why the average scores in Uzbekistan are growing. 1,500 is no longer anything surprising, right? Mm -hmm. But when I took it three years ago, no one had 1,520 in Uzbekistan mm -hmm. or did someone have it? In Samarkand, at mm -hmm. least, I know no one had it, you know? The score I got in English, I, I'm sure it was the highest one in Uzbekistan, 730. Even the kids who got into Yale at that point, right? Uh, their scores were 710 and 700 for English. But my like English score in SAT reading was 730. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I got a 790 for math. Like it was the second attempt. The first attempt, it was a 4, 1460. The second time, I got the same score for English, but my math improved from 730 to 790. So my overall score became to be a 1520. It was like a big deal as of that time, you know? It was a big, big, big achievement, a big score. Like three years ago, no one knew about SAT. Like the resources were really, really scarce. So like even with that scarcity, you know, even when there was no demand, I somehow broke through it, I think, and did like pretty well. So how did you pull that off? How did you manage to get 1520? And one more fun fact, I studied for only three months, actually. For With two months of prep, this guy went on to get 15, 20. Yeah. All right, now I'm out of here, okay? I'm out of here. I, I feel like a sore loser right now. No, bro, like, you're not. You are not. Trust me. You are actually yeah. Yeah. the reason, like, you know, why I kept, like, going with this thing. But, yeah. Uh, how? You asked how, right? Yes, sir, please. Okay. Do tell us the story. <laughs> so do tell, do tell yeah. us the whole story. Sure, sure. Uh -huh. College applications were approaching. I uh -huh. always wanted to study in the US, but I didn't know anything about it. Uh -huh. That's the point where I'm meeting my best friend, Bobir John, mm -hmm. right? He's coming to Uzbekistan. Not Bobir John, it's Bob. It's Bob. Yeah, Bob. okay. Let's call him Bob. <laughs> uh, that's where he's coming, right? Uh, it's May of 2021. He's coming to Uzbekistan from the US. And then he's phoning the director of our school and telling him, hey, like, seems like you guys offer SAT tests here. Can I take them? Mm -hmm. uh, and then he told no, like, because at that point, we were, like, they were not offering SAT. They were not offering SAT. They offered it for a certain time, but I think it was not, like, financially. I don't know, like, mm -hmm. what is what the problem is. I think it was not financially feasible for them, but they canceled it. But that guy still came to talk in person, right? Bobby or John, I mean. Uh, Bob. Yeah, yeah Bob. Mm -hmm. And then that's where I met him. You know, like I was like, hey, like you are American. He was like a role model in my eyes because uh -huh. that's the country I always wanted to go to, right? Uh -huh. At that point, I didn't know anything. I didn't have resources. I didn't have the knowledge I needed to have. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, like I am. And then we like went out for lunch, right? Mm -hmm. He told I'm studying for SAT. I asked him what it is. He told like, this is a test, you know, uh, which stands for scholastic assessment test that you use, uh, th that you take to get into American colleges. And then like I processed it in my mind. I told to myself, it's something like DTM in Uzbekistan, that time in Uzbekistan, you know? That's when I found out about the test. Then I went home, I started researching it. At that point, I realized it's actually mandatory to get into universities. Right now, universities are test optional, right? But when I was applying in my application cycle, they still were not test optional. They were requiring tests. I mean, test scores, SAT test scores to be sub submitted or ACT test scores. I started freaking out because I didn't know what to study, where to study, what to do. The next day, I went and talked to my math instructor, math teacher who was teaching me math at that time. Like I told, hey, do you know about this test? He was like, yeah, of course I do and etc. There is actually a guy who is also a math instructor who can like get you ready for SAT math. Like without losing time, I went and saw him. Like he was a really strict teacher. You know, he was like, if you cannot show me the result that I want, I'm not taking you. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, I had a very limited time to study, only three months. I needed to register for the test in August. There was only one testing center in Uzbekistan, two, Tashkent International School and uh, the Lyceum of Foreign Languages. And like, I mean, the Institute of Foreign Languages. The test was administered in, like in the Lyceum, right? So there were only two test centers. We needed to register early. And it was a big deal as of that time, you know? Like it was, SAT was really scarce in everything, in demand, in resources, in everything. So he was like, you've got a very short time to study. Like, I'm sure you cannot get that score. 
in a matter of three months, you cannot get that score. I was like begging him, like, you know, literally begging him, give me this chance, please. Like, uh, I cannot move on like that. I've been working so hard until this point, but I only now realize that I need to study for a test like this and etc. And he like, yeah, he finally agreed. Seeing the urge, you know, the desire in my eyes, the kid who just wanted to get it done, reach the score, he gave me the chance. So from the next day on, uh, actually that day I took a mock test. I met some guys who were also studying for SAT. We became like really good friends. Uh, and the next day we agreed, to, to, it turned out that those guys were coming to his house in the morning at 5 a.m. and starting their study sessions. By the afternoon, they used to move like to the center, the educational uh, center, uh, and stay there uh, up hold to on, late. Hang on, hang on a second. You said 5 a.m.? 5 a.m., yeah. 5 in the morning? 5 in the morning, yeah. That's how strict he was. He All wanted right. kids who studied, you know, who really, really were devoted to what they were doing. I... I don't think I don't think I'd survive a day in that environment. Okay, I, you know what? If you come to my house at five a.m., you'll find me in my bed. <laughs> okay, the, this, the same has always been the case. Uh, okay, I, I'm not. I can't imagine myself to be doing anything else five in, in the morning. Yeah, right, this is nuts. I mean, right, it is crazy. I, I, yeah. here's, I actually want to bring this up real quick. Mm -hmm. Those teachers who make their students wake up five in the morning to study. I think they're actually taking a, a lot away from their health, from their students' health. You know, you, you do realize sleep is important for a lot of things. You need sleep for rest and recovery. You need sleep for memory consolidation. You need sleep for you know, good mood the next day. You need sleep for you know, normal growth of your body and, you know, your hormones you, know, you need sleep for sleep is like an elixir without sleep what guess what happens when you're sleep deprived you're you're moody you don't feel like doing anything or you're less attentive you start making a lot of silly mistakes right you're generally not there and you're so out of touch with reality it's as if there's a veil over your eyes and you can't see right all right that, Muhammad Ali, so i would sleep, say sleep is important yeah I would say when you are at the point where, mm -hmm. where you've got only two to three months, you know, to do something that decides... And even then, yeah, I think the it's course of your I, life, think, I think it's counterproductive. It is. To stay up or to, you know, to burn the candle at both ends, trying to get just it is, extra, yeah. some extra work done. But I, I don't think that information is going to stick in your mind. No, like, okay. Probably not. But at that time, no. if we slept more, you know, if we slept for eight to nine hours and missed those study hours, we would not be able to take the test. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't make it, you know, we wouldn't make it on time. That's the rush. That, that's the pressure we have. Let me ask you this. Uh -huh. Were your group mates also successful? Did they also go on to get impressive scores no. in their SATs? No. Exactly. You were the only one. You were the only one. And don't you think part of the reason was because their sleep was messed up? Might be. Maybe. Never thought about it. But there are other reasons for that. I know right. I know those reasons, you know. Uh -huh. But I know those reasons. It's like learning abilities. But mm -hmm. what you what what you're saying right now, I just started thinking about it. I never yeah. thought about it. It, it makes honest. a lot of sense. Cause right? I, this is what I'm yeah. telling my students when they tell me, teacher, I had to stay up late to get your speaking assignment done. And when I tell them is all right, next time if it comes between choosing your homework and sleep, go for sleep. I want you to go to go to go to bed early. Yeah. Get some sleep, wake up the next morning with fresh <clears throat> mind, and then get on with your studies. Mm -hmm. Sleep comes first. This is the deal, yeah. Yeah. Okay, what you are saying is scientifically true, mm -hmm. and yeah, it actually applies to certain people, it's, but it doesn't apply to me surprisingly. It's, it's not scientifically true, it's intuitively true. Intuitively you don't true, have, yeah. You don't have to be a scientist to understand that, I guess, to get that. But for me personally, it's vice versa. When I sleep a lot for seven to eight hours, mm -hmm. I feel I go pale. I literally go pale. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'm not mistaking the word. I go pale mm -hmm. and I feel such a big, big fatigue, you know? I feel, mm -hmm. I start feeling exhausted, headache and etc. Mood swings. But when I sleep for four to five hours, I feel more energetic. It is like, I don't know how it works. It's just you're wired different. Might be. It might you're, you're be. You're wired yeah, different. You're not, be. you're not like guys yeah. out there. You're not like us. <laughs> I, I never this slept guy, a lot, to be honest. Different. This guy, this guy's a literal freak. <laughs> <laughs> probably it was offensive but okay <laughs> i usually go yeah. to bed at 1 a.m uh -huh. and then the latest i wake up is 7 a.m i cannot sleep anymore you know i cannot sleep uh -huh. after that point that's right. i wake up i feel really really mm -hmm. energized 
like for about two to three hours mm -hmm. then i start losing energy again but then i go mm -hmm. for a run for example right mm -hmm. like for cardio exercise and then i start like feeling energetic again but yeah uh it was an interesting discussion about sleep but i think you are going to overthrow me in this <laughs> but because like it seems like you have more experience more information about it you know i've never been like okay i've never went deep into the like sleep. consequences of sleep deprivation you know sleep sleep is so essential like i can't stress enough how important it is to get quality sleep every night you know, yeah. so a lot of the smart people out there i listen to intellectuals they talk about sleep hygiene they talk about having clear bedtime hours they talk about having the right bed mattress they talk about having the right, <laughs> right room temperature all those things right and yeah. it's actually a big industry now right it all is. those podcasters you watch they're selling their sleep products because i buy into it personally i buy into this whole idea that sleep because i, I don't think you have to be a scientist to understand that to understand there are consequences oh, yeah, yeah. you're right yeah to yeah. sleep deprivation, yeah. right? I just feel it, right? On those days when I'm sleep deprived, I'm mentally numb. <laughs> My mind is not working, all right? It's, I'm literally off, <laughs> right? Yeah. And why don't, why don't you actually try fixing your sleeping routine and I ha tried, get, I tried get like eight, yeah. seven, eight hours of sleep a night, right? And see how your life changes. Try it for a couple of weeks. It's not so bad. Just for a too. change. It's not, it's not yeah. bad now as well. Uh -huh. Like I'm satisfied, to be honest. But uh -huh. I think... How many hours of sleep do you get? On average, uh -huh. like five hours or six hours. Five, six hours. Okay, on Sundays, uh -huh. I might go yeah. for eight hours. But after that, I start feeling huge headache. Uh -huh. But I know why that happens. Because like of the changes in my circadian rhythm, you know? Uh -huh. The body clock changes. Yeah. And your like, body cannot take the change. That's mm -hmm. why you start getting headaches and etc. I know the reason. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like more than six hours, I feel like it's too much. Yeah. I don't like it. Six hours are enough for with, me. with me, it's seven, eight hours. It's like my yeah. sweet spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just people are, like I said. Exactly, wired, they are wired different. different. Why are we're, different? Yeah, they are wired different. different. But everyone needs sleep. That's what yeah. I agree uh. with for sure. Because, you know, like during the semester, this semester has been so tough for me. I mm. was doing 40 hours of internship, like uh. on campus, of course. I didn't travel like, you know, uh, outside the campus. It was on campus, like an accounting internship. I was working, working for the fiscal office there. Uh, and at the same time, like I was taking some credit hours, right? I was taking some credit hours. I was taking classes and like on the side, we've got like some things with my friend, Bob Virjan, you know? So uh, you it mean, was super you mean, busy. You mean Bob? Bob. Yes, Bob, not Bob Virjan. <laughs> now, like, you know, we switch it. We switch it. Like he's calling him Bob and I'm calling him Bob Virjan. <laughs> like that, that was an interesting I transition, mean, it's, right? It's, it's, it's got a nice ring to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy spilled the beans while you were gone, Mr. Bobberjan. He told me that he's he here. Likes, oh, yeah, okay. He, he I never is. realized he's here, yeah. to be honest. You know, yeah. I never realized he's here. Yeah, he just <laughs> he, he sneaked in a few yeah. minutes ago. He's sitting there behind the camera. I told, right now. I told no one calls you Bob apart from us, you know, but uh -huh. I called like yeah. not not intentionally. It was inadvertent, but yeah. So how do you like it? You preferred if we call you Bobberjan or Bob? <laughs> For my friends, like you can call me Bob. Like, I uh -huh. like do you allow him to call you Bob? Uh-huh. Okay, uh, we can call him. No, Bob I actually then. like his actual name. I I can't stand it when people call me nicknames, right? Because what's your I, nickname actually? Well, Mo? no, people. My folks at home call me Ali because ah. Ali Muhammad Ali is just a bit of a yeah, mouthful, yeah, yeah. right? Right. And people when I was in the US, people also used to call me Ali. Yeah, oh, not okay. Muhammad Ali, but Ali. Right. Just because it's easier, I guess, right? Yeah, it just, just rolls off the easier. tongue. But I I I wasn't I was never bothered with that, people calling me my nickname, right? Yeah. But I but I realized your name is is a big part of your identity. It right? is. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's there's only one Muhammad Ali who looks like me, who talks like me, walks like me, who thinks like me, who acts like me. <laughs> and yeah, I I yeah, that sounds I, like the lyrics I, I, from yeah, a song, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. I hate, I hate to see or hear it to be, you know, butchered. So, it's Muhammad Ali, you better call me Muhammad Ali. So, I like it this way. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, how do you, you like to be called? I, I guess you like to be called Bob Burjan, right? When professors started butchering your name as Bob Burjan, Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then you like, just call me Bob. Yeah. 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 Sure. 
So they get a Bob pass, mm -hmm. but we don't get a Bob pass because we know how to pronounce yeah. his name. Oh, so we're going to call him Bob or John. Yeah. Cause, okay. Cause yeah. At this walked, point, yeah, we are calling him Bob or John. In, okay? but <laughs> he just walked in? Because he just yeah, okay. what, because he walked in. Okay. When he's away, though, we're going to go back to Bob. <laughs> okay. No problem. <laughs> That's a deal. Yeah. yeah, I forgot what we were talking about. We're talking yes. about your SAT experience. Uh, we were talking about my SAT experience, right? Yeah, yes, sir. And before that, uh, after that, we t started talking about sleep yeah. because you were telling me about your oh, yeah, teacher yeah, 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 who yeah. made you and your friends yeah. wake up five in the morning yeah. and go to class. Yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't help and say something. I couldn't help and... But <clears> yeah, <throat> that period in my life, it was Chime really, in. really progressive. It was really progressive because... Mm -hmm. Okay, when I just came, I took my first exam. I'm not going to lie. I scored an 800 overall. You know, mm -hmm. like math, I didn't do it at all because I didn't understand anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, I did a couple of questions. Like the overall score came out to be an 800. Mm -hmm. I was really discouraged, but I knew, I knew that I have three months ahead of me. And as I told again, Bobby John was there. That's mm -hmm. the point where we met, you know, mm -hmm. and started working together because mm -hmm. he was studying for SAT. I was studying for SAT. So I used to, I used to go there like, Every day at 6 a.m. in the morning, we used to start our study sessions. Uh, we used to study independently until 10 to 11 a.m. And then we would relocate to our center where we would ask any questions we had from our teacher, you know, like, okay, we are doing math there. There is obviously something we don't know. But it was mostly about self-studying. We were helping ourselves. There were no, no instructors, like, as of that time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like... We used to stay there until the evening, right? Like until 7 p.m., 6 p.m. And then I would go to another educational center where your Bob was like mm -hmm. staying, mm -hmm. I mean, studying. And then I used to study with him as well. Like we used to do practice tests together. Three months, my life was all about SAT. Like, yeah, I used to get tired. Like I no longer wanted to do it. I went through burnouts, but I honestly, genuinely did not care. Like, yeah, what you told about sleep, that's right. But I was not at the state, at the condition w where I needed to realize it, you know? Like my eyes could not see it. Mm -hmm. I had three months, this is my only chance. My parents are giving me only one attempt. You either take it this year, you either get into colleges this year, and then we are allowing you to leave, or else you're just staying in Uzbekistan and not wasting your time because there is societal pressure, right? The gossips people are gonna make, why mm -hmm. he's not studying this year, why he couldn't get in and etc. Mm -hmm. So like, just because of that pressure, like, I genuinely did not care about my health, about my burnout. I was doing it sad. I was doing it broke. I mean, like <laughs> Instagram influencers say, you know. But yeah, uh, only within three months, I made huge progress. Like, four days before my like exam, I'm taking my last practice test, you know. I've been getting 1450, 1460, 1500 on my practice test consistently. Like, uh, in the latest state, I mean, days of my preparation, when it was getting closer to the test date. But the last exam I took, just before we left to Tashkent, like our teacher like asked us to take a practice test, you know, the mm -hmm. last one. He printed it out for us. It was an actual test from 2019. I even remember which practice test it was. We did it. And guess what? I'm getting a 1250. That's such a big change. And that's such a big, big attack on someone, you know, like, who's having the only chance to take this test? Mm -hmm. I came here. Like, we went around for a couple of days because before our test, we wanted to recover. Like, mentally, physically, you know, mm -hmm. because we were truly, truly tired doing the same thing, you mm -hmm. know. Like, every day for many hours, it gets really monotonous and it, mm -hmm. like, hits you mentally a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So, we went earlier, but, like, I was... Okay, that's what I was like that that was all I was thinking about, you know? My SAT. Can I can I actually break through it? Can I get the score I need and etc. And all those hangouts and etc. I was not liking them to be honest. I was just staying and thinking about my test. And then a night before my test, I didn't sleep at like I didn't sleep at all. I pulled an all-nighter because I couldn't sleep, right? I just went out and started studying again. Mm -hmm. My test is scheduled for 8 a.m., right? Mm -hmm. And I should get some sleep before that. Because if I don't get sleep, as you told, I'm going to have a very short attention span. I'll be making silly mistakes. And if I like have the urge to sleep during the exam, it's over, right? I'm going to fail it for sure. I didn't sleep before my exam. Uh, so I went, I took it. It was my, my first attempt. I thought like I did awful. 
just because like it was my first time transferring answers like to the SAT answer sheet. I never saw it when we were practicing. Mm -hmm. We didn't try with the answer sheet. So like working it around, you know, like understanding how I should feel it. All of those things took a lot of time and I thought I messed it up there. Like about the test in general, my impressions were fine, but not that good. And I was just waiting for my results. I don't know why, but those years I was, I felt like I'm really unlucky. This was the test I studied so hard for, right? I'm checking college board after 13 days. I'm like trying to reload the website and it says like the test has not been taken yet. That means like, okay, at that time, college board had three statuses for your test, right? It either said you did not take the test, it was upcoming, or else the scores are pending or else the scores are released. I don't know if it's still the same, right? And even like a month after I took my test, college board website was saying my test is upcoming. My scores were not even pending. I thought they are not gonna release our scores. I somehow phoned them, right? I was from Uzbekistan. I didn't know I could like go international, phone them, you know? Like the things I knew, they were very limited. Uh, so you, I somehow- You just worked things out because you were in a panic yes, mode. Yes, yes, yes. You were yeah, in a panic mode. Yeah, that's the thing, that's the thing. Yeah, that's the idea. I was in a panic mode. I was just working and not like, you know, trying to think outside the box to see the problem from outside. I was just trying to somehow work it around and get it instantly. Uh, and then they told, okay, so this is what happened. We noticed there was big fraud, right? Big cheating in your exam. Uh, how, how, how did we know that? Like most of the answers that we are checking, they are so similar. Students were copying. Uh, like the scores as of that test date, like they released at Kazakhstan first after a month. And then after one and a half months, they released Azerbaijan result after two months. Not like after 13 days as it should be. After two months, they are releasing our scores. That's oct October. I already like registered for the October test as well. Mm -hmm. Like that's my second attempt. My first results came out. It was a 1460 as I told you earlier, right? Mm -hmm. It was a 1460. And you cannot even imagine how happy I was. I would say it's like, it was the happiest moment in my life because seeing like 734 maths, yeah, it's not mm -hmm. a like big deal like because 800 is more than possible. But seeing a, a 730 for English, right, for evidence-based based reading and writing, that came as a big shock to me because I knew for sure like it was the first score like in Samarkand, you know, it was the highest score in Samarkand at the time and I was taking pride in myself. Mm -hmm. I took my test in October. Again, I got a 730 for English, but this time my math score went up from like 730 to 790 and those results came out quick. Uh, once I was done with my SAT, I started with my college applications, right? I didn't want to lose time because deadlines were rolling in. I had only 25 to 30 days to submit my early decision application. You can apply to only one university for early decision, right? Uh, I picked like NYU for that. Uh, we used, I, again, like I used to wake up at five because of time differences because Bobby John was helping me. Like we were like working together, you know, there were certain things I was good at. There were certain things he was good at and we were collaborating. So like, what are some of the things he was good at and some of the things you were good at, he okay. wasn't good at? Okay, I can actually like tell it. All right, we were collaborating on writing, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna like talk about that perspective, okay? That side of things, not at, like other things because there are a lot of things. So where you're mostly we, helping you out yeah, with yeah, writing. Yeah, 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 yeah. There are a lot of things where we collaborate just because I've got like my strong points and he's got his strong points and just mm -hmm. we bring everything to the table and work together, right? Mm -hmm. But at that time we were working on our essays uh, and he was really, really strong in terms of creativity. He mm -hmm. went to an American high school. He knew what admissions officers like. He knew what American people in general like, you know, mm -hmm. and he could come up with those creative ideas. Me, mm -hmm. I was better with style. Like I've always had good writing style, you know? I've always been passionate about writing and like not about, like not only in IELTS, I used to do, you know, a lot of writing outside SAT and IELTS. Uh -huh. Like I loved writing and in terms of style, I was better. So I came with style, I put it on the table, you know, Lexis, how you organize things, how you deliver things. Mm -hmm. While with creativity, he was better. So we became one force basically and applied together, right? Um, I can actually talk about my admissions results as well. Sure, sure, please. <laughs> okay, yeah. Do tell us. Because I'm trying to jump without listening to questions, you know, like that's hey, kind of more convenient. Uh, like I said, this is your episode. Okay, okay yeah. Just knock yourself out. Uh, so basically, yeah, the results starting coming out, uh, like NYU, I got waitlisted. Mm -hmm. uh, 
that was my early decision mm -hmm. application. But I applied to like uh, to UPenn for regular decision and I got in. You know UPenn, right? It's like University of Pennsylvania. It's an Ivy League school. Yeah. Like very competitive, very selective. For early, I mean, for regular decision, I applied to a couple of other prestigious schools, including Richmond. It's really selective, 20% acceptance rate. Uh, one of the most famous liberal arts universities in the US, actually. I mm -hmm. got into Lafayette. I love the campus, to be honest. Like, you can actually look it up. They've got the most beautiful campus in the US, I would say. Like, it's, you said it, it Raphael, feels like Raphael, right? Lafayette, yes, Lafayette. Uh -huh. I'll look it up right away. Yeah, you, you yeah. Keep the going. campus is just crazy. I can just keep going, right? Uh -huh. I got into King's College in the UK, which is also mm -hmm. very, very like ext extremely selective and prestigious. I, I think their acceptance rate is 13%. Uh -huh. So yeah, all of those results came out. I, and then mm -hmm. like I eventually picked USF just because like I screwed up the financial side of things there. You basically have to submit a form called CSS profile, right? That checks if you are eligible for need-based scholarships, mm -hmm. need-based aid. I did my CSS profile, but in fear of being rejected, I overstated the amount my parents could contribute. Mm -hmm. I overstated it to the point where those universities never considered me for like need-based financial aid. They gave me eight merit-based scholarships, but I still had to pay 50K per year, like 60K per year, you know? It was crazy. <laughs> I wonder what, I your, couldn't go for a gap what year. your parents' reaction to <laughs> yeah, hearing yeah, yeah. that was... <laughs> I mean, we had a big 50, fight at home. I don't remember 50, that time. 50K <laughs> a month, yeah. a, a year? <laughs> that adds up to $200,000 in More total. than that. It's like almost like $300,000 invested mm. in your education for four years. Yeah. It's not worth it. Never. That's a lot. That's, That's a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, but I come from an ordinary family, so I couldn't go for that choice. Mm -hmm. But like still, I had to pick something, right? Uh, and then like the most affordable option for me was University of South Florida, USF, the university I'm going to right now. And I'm actually on a full tuition scholarship there right now. I'm on a full tuition. They are covering my tuition and I just have to pay for my living. Uh, I got the merit-based scholarship from the university. And then when I went there, I applied for some uh, additional aid, you know? And I got it. Like there was a program called 25 under 25 where they pick 25 best business school students because I'm in business school, right? They pick the best 25 like business students. They put them up for votes. Students vote for those students, right? And 25 of those like who win those elections, they get the scholarship. And I was one of them. It was an $8,000 scholarship renewable annually. And with the merit-based scholarship I got as part of my application, like added up, that covers my tuition. So I just have to pay for my living, which is actually a good deal for America. It, it is. It, it is a great deal. It is, yeah. Yeah. Like getting free there, education, you know. I mean, why not? <laughs> <laughs> that that's a that's a dream come true for that's a dream come true for a lot of students out yeah, there. Yeah, it is. It's, it's it is. It's practically a full ride scholarship, right? Uh, okay, I mean, not it's exactly. Not, a, not exactly. So, what, what, but this what, is almost full ride because I don't spend much for living. So, to be what is a full ride scholarship? Explain what is a full ride scholarship? Yes, sir. Okay, full ride scholarship is when you're like tuition, okay, room and board, mm -hmm. and traveling are covered if you are an international student. Full ride scholarship is when universities pay for your ticket, right? They buy you a ticket once a year in summer so that you can go back home and then travel mm -hmm. back to America. So it's like two way yeah, trip. Yeah, two way. Yeah, that's like they get your two way ticket for you, a round trip. Uh, they cover your dormitory, right? Uh -huh. They give you a free meal plan, open access meal plan, I where eat. <laughs> you can eat unlimited food on campus. And then they make your education free. You don't pay anything like for your education. Wow. No tuition, no nothing, right? Wow. And then in some cases, they give you a stipend. Like they additional even pay, money. They yeah. even pay you yeah. for going to college. Yeah, yeah, yeah they do. Uh, That's and, a full and, and, and I wonder... There is a reason why I they wonder. Do that. I wonder what kind of a guy or what how into, how smart you're supposed to be to get that sort of scholarship. This guy, yeah, this guy is sitting actually, behind the camera yeah. with a full ride scholarship. He, he's on a full ride scholarship. Like he's got that stipend. Uh, like his university right. basically if buys that's not a secret, How much do you get paid to go to college? <laughs> um, okay, two thousand every year for technology. Mm -hmm. Plus two k per semester. Six to seven thousand dollars a year. That yeah. that works out. How many? How much a month? Um, it's like five. Five. Month of school in total, I would say. Uh, but usually, I get two thousand, three thousand per semester. If you really think about it, mm -hmm. three thousand for like three months. Or like mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's still. For not doing anything, we're just going exactly. to school. No, like, yeah. <laughs> there, is a, there is a reason behind that. There is a reason why universities do that. When they start taking those students, right? Uh -huh. 
they look at what type of person they are. Like, okay, why students would need to fund these students, right? Like, mm -hmm. why would they need to fund them? They are not obliged, right? It's a big, big, big harm damage to their pockets. They're basically investing in those students. They know that once they graduate, right, and become like very famous, rich, they get wealth, they get fame, right? They're going to give back to that university, right? They will give back. How? They will do donations. The scholarship I got is actually from alumni donations. They donate money to university mm -hmm. saying, hey, like fund students like me uh, and basically like give them more support. Mm -hmm. They know that once they grow up, once they graduate and become successful, they will give back to the university, right? Like grow its prestige. Mm -hmm. The university will take pride in having alumni like them. Like actually when you research the universities, when you look up universities, one of the parameters that you check is alumni success stories, right? You check who their alumni were. Uh, and if you see someone you recognize, you really want to go to that university, right? You pay for it and you go to it. The university benefits financially, like uh, first of all, and then it grows its reputation, right? Not only uh, with their alumni, reputation among people in general, you know, because once those alumni graduate from those universities, they are going, and when they're asked where are you graduated from, they like tell the name of that university, right? And it's like prestige, reputation among people, how people perceive it changes. That's why universities invest in those students. They know they're gonna get returns, right? Mm -hmm. Like much higher returns. They invest in students, they give us scholarships, right? They say, hey, like you can study for free, but they know once we graduate, become mm -hmm. successful, like just because of us, they'll get 100, like at least like 200, 300, 400, maybe thousands of students, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. There is a reason why they do that. And like, yeah, they never do it just because they want to do it. Yeah, well, there, there is no such thing as free lunch, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, can, yeah. you guys, can you guys give the AC a break? I'm starting to get a headache, thanks. Wow. <laughs> I really, I really want to be a student again, guys. All right, I'm starting to change my mind about teaching and my current job, right? <laughs> Seriously, though, after these two episodes I had <clears throat> with U.S. students, all right, I want to go back to school now. Yeah. It is fun. <laughs> school is good. It is. It is good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't have much to care about, uh -huh. but yeah, like, you know, the best, the best thing about schooling, like, I disagree with the idea that school is a scam. It's not a scam because mm -hmm. this is the time, okay, when you, you are not just studying but exploring yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, okay, I'm an accounting student, right? I'm not supposed to, to be spending all of my time on my accounting classes. They are tough. They are boring. That's the bare minimum I need to get done, right? Mm -hmm. I need to pass that class. I need to get a good grade. That's the bare minimum I'm doing. But apart from that, like I'm doing a lot of things outside the campus, right? I'm going and joining clubs, organizations. I'm talking to different places. I'm going to mock trials. Like I'm doing mock interviews. Mm -hmm. I'm like searching answers for questions that have always interested me. Mm -hmm. If I'm on a full work mode, right? Working 50, 80 hours a day, mm -hmm. just grinding. Would I have time for that self-exploration? Would mm -hmm. I have time to search for like answers for questions that interest me? I have that, I will have that question for a mind. I mean, for a moment in my mind, right? It will click, then I will forget about it. Mm -hmm. I will forget to search for an answer. But as a college student, you're always like, you know, behind the desk, stuck, like, searching for answers for questions that have always interested in you and you have that that time for like you know research exploration to do things you have always wanted to do that's the time when you like basically find yourself so college is not all about studying and then you know like graduating and getting a job no if you use that time wisely it's a chance for you to see who you are to get your position in life and to decide where which direction you want to go on like starting from that point Right, right. It's like a training ground. Yes, exactly. Where stakes exactly. are low. Exactly. You it get is. to try different things. That's why I love it. Like, I don't yeah. want to go out of school, to be honest. Uh -huh. Like, most people <laughs> tell me, hey, like, why would you need a master's degree? Like, yeah. just move on with your life. I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. uh, I will work for one year, right? I'll get funding for my master's degree. And then, like, I'll go to the school I want to go to mm -hmm. to keep exploring myself. After master's, yes, I will stop because at that point in my life, like my parents are going to retire, right? I need to feed my family. I need to sustain them well because I've got big life plans. Uh, I'll be moving on. But I ha I have to make sure before rushing to make money, right? To make a lot of money. Before rushing to be super, super rich and successful. The first thing I need to do, I should realize who I am in life. Mm -hmm. like what I deserve, what I can do, what I want. Once I have answers to those questions, you know, what I once I have my positioning in life, once I get that positioning, I'm sure I can get everything. I can do everything. But... 
first I need to answer those questions that mm. like have always been like tickling in my mind, you know? Mm. And what are, what are some of those questions? Let's explore those questions right now. <laughs> wow, it's going to get really, really philosophical. Okay. Um, what, what's number one question bothering you right now? Is it like, who, who am I? I would say so because, uh-huh. okay, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sound really broad, who am I? Uh-huh. I have already explored and found mm-hmm. myself in many, many, res- like, you know, uh, respects, but... Uh, there is still I really want to explore about myself. There mm-hmm. is still a lot I don't know, right? For example, uh, this question, okay, it is really sensitive and I don't want to ask it in front of the camera, but okay, like if you wish you can cut this part. The question, can I live without my parents, my parents for example? Am I ready to take that pressure? Am I ready to mm-hmm. handle it? And etc. I right? think you are pretty mature for your age. I you am, are. I am, but... I really need to make sure I can answer that question. And college is a good mm. place to answer that question. How? I'm being independent, right? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I'm growing more and more independent from my parents. Mm-hmm. I'm learning to solve, right? Handle problems by myself. So one part of the puzzle will be solved, right? The second part of the puzzle, do I really want to go to, for example, business, to finance? Is that something I can handle? So I'm trying myself out in audit, right? I'm trying myself out in tax. I'm trying myself out in investment banking. Like, there are a lot of other personal questions. I cannot think of them right now because there are a lot of them, actually. Mm-hmm. I just need to think, reflect, you know. It doesn't come overnight. Well, well yeah. the good news is you have a couple more years exactly. to figure them out, Exactly, right? exactly. Once I figure them out, I'm sure, like, uh-huh. once I have strong positioning in life, you know, mm-hmm. once I know who I am, once I know what I want to do, mm-hmm. I can just move on, like, mm-hmm. work as hard as I have always been working, right? Be diligent mm-hmm. and get like everything I want on the table. Yeah. Right. That's how I look at things. Yeah. It's a very, very good perspective mm. for someone your age. Yeah. It's, um, I'm, I'm really, I'm, yeah, I'm, I really wish I had that perspective when I was your age. I was, I was, I'd always been kind of a guy who, who wanted things to happen instantly and never gave myself the chance, the opportunity to explore my interests. And but 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 I guess I'm doing it right now. Yeah. I mean, but yeah. just better yeah. late than never, right? Yeah. Okay. What do you say we talk a little about your interests as well? What kind of interests do you have outside uh, academics? <laughs> outside the yeah, academic outside world. Outside academics, outside work. Yeah. Um, okay. So what do you find yourself uh, when you're not? I had a hobby. I still working? have that hobby. I'm learning to play the guitar, for example, right now. I'm, I'm like uh-huh. learning to play the guitar. I really, really like it. I actually was learning it two years ago, but mm-hmm. then I stopped it temporarily because there were more important things I had to focus on and I couldn't spare time. There was no way I could spare time for my social life, for my interests, you know? So where does that inspiration come from? Why did you decide to take up the guitar? Again? Or no, initially? I mean, initial initially. inspiration, yeah. What was, the, what was the source of your inspiration? <laughs> okay, uh, you got any I don't know. Favorite I, like, singer I was in mind? a big music guy. I was a big music guy, yeah. Okay. And I always wanted to play the guitar. But uh-huh. like honestly, I don't wanna talk about who my favorite singer was. Oh, like, why not? It's really private. <laughs> this guy okay. is this guy this guy is Jalolatun <laughs> Ahmad Ali, the Uzbek singer, you know? Uh, I know uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't suppose I'm the type of guy who would listen to his songs heartbroken and such because I, I'm not like that. I don't even know who the guy is. <laughs> you see, you don't even know who he is. And it's like I really, don't. really surprising. But yeah, that's my musical taste. Yeah. I like the way he plays the guitar, uh-huh. etc. You know, I like the way he sings mm-hmm. and etc. Yeah, I was a big music guy, and the only instrument I wanted to learn was the guitar because Okay, with piano, you cannot do everything. You cannot mm-hmm. play any note, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what other instruments do you have? Like drums, you cannot yeah. play any music you, you want, right? Mm-hmm. But with guitar, you can produce anything you want. Yeah. Like, literally, you can reproduce piano right. with the guitar, right? Wow. You can reproduce any that. song. You can do anything. Like right. there is nothing you cannot do with the guitar. Mm-hmm. That's why I wanted to learn that instrument. So, but like after trying it for a couple of times, not for a couple of times, for a couple mm-hmm. of months, like my fingers like honestly they started hurting so much mm-hmm. uh because it's a big pressure on your fingers right like uh it pierces like the the strings yeah the strings pierce through your fingers they uh, cut they cut uh-huh. them right and then it starts hurting so like, you don't you don't wear any kind of gloves or protection you cannot wear anything there are two yeah, types right there is an uh-huh. acoustic guitar there is a classic uh-huh. guitar uh-huh. at that time i didn't understand that and then i got the acoustic one. Oh, you might want to yeah, sit closer with to the, the metallic, mi- mic with the, yes. uh, with the metallic strings uh-huh. while if i got the classic guitar at that time 
uh, it would have the like strings made of rubber. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt your fingers. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't give up just because it hurt. I didn't have time as I told again, but that pain was a playing factor oh, too. What, what kind of music like do you play on guitar? Do you like I'm a beginner, so I cannot so, pick. Uh -huh. I'm, not, I'm a beginner. I'm just learning the accords, right? Right. Uh, the movements, the beats, right. and all of those things. I cannot pick like the type of music I want when to When you play. said the guitar, I thought of Shawn Mendes. <laughs> I thought you're a Shawn Mendes <laughs> oh, guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's, he, he's, his guitar skills are awesome too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus yeah. it's cute. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You Don't should check him out. You, you should check him out. He's got, he's got a lot of great songs. So I like them. Oh, yeah, this. there was an Iranian guitar player. Like mm -hmm. he's actually my role model. Turkish singers, all of mm -hmm. them play the guitar, right? Uh, That's like, yeah, those are the musicians I really mm -hmm. like, admire. I would uh, say. Do you want to start making your own content one day? Oh, actually, and there was a movie that actually led me to come back to guitar. Uh -huh. I watched a Turkish movie recently. It was a drama. I don't uh -huh. watch dramas. Okay. But Turkish dramas, like I tried to watch them once. Uh -huh. It turns out they are really, really interesting. You know, mm -hmm. it was called My Dad's Violin. Uh huh. It's about like two brothers, right? The older brother sends his younger brother to Italy, like because both of them are oppressed. They've got a stepfather who basically puts them under immense pressure, right? Mm -hmm. And then the older brother sends his younger brother to Italy, like makes money, saves it up and buys a ticket for him. Uh, but he stays in Turkey and grows up. Like, and then the movie is taking place 30 years after that occurrence, his younger brother who went to Italy becomes really, really successful. But he always thinks my older brother betrayed me. He sent me and he himself stayed in Turkey, right? Uh, he becomes a very famous guitar player, I mean, violin player, uh, while he like becomes a beggar, not a beggar, you know, people mm -hmm. who play music outside mm -hmm. and try to get money from people for that. That's how mm -hmm. they make a living, right? Uh, then like the plot develops, it gets really, really touching. Uh, how they basically work that thing out, how he finds out about what his brother actually did after his brother actually dies from lung cancer. Like, I really loved it, and it gave me an urge to start practicing a musical instrument again, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't want the violin. Like, I don't like it, to be honest. So mm -hmm. I, I started to, I mean, I decided to restart guitar, you know, playing the guitar. Yeah, I was gonna. That's how I came. Yeah, back to I it. was gonna ask you if you're gonna start making your own content videos of you playing the guitar and put them on YouTube. I don't think I'm gonna have. I'd be your that. first subscriber. <laughs> I swear. Oh well, yeah. If that's the case, I might yeah, consider I'd, it. <laughs> yeah, you should give it a shot. But yeah, 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 no. yeah. Like I have mm. the whole summer ahead mm -hmm. right now. Like uh, I'm doing an internship. I took mm -hmm. some summer classes. Uh, mm -hmm. like, and I have some time left for playing the guitar and, too. So hopefully, and, I'll and get that's good. That's actually makes you a unique individual. Someone with a unique skill set. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I remember watching a podcast, Joe Rogan featuring Naval Ravikant, and they talk about why you should n never have the same job your entire life, that you should try different things. And the analogy they use is the circus analogy. When you go to a circus, you see a unicycle, that's interesting, yeah. Well, and you see a bear, that's also interesting. But when you see a bear on a unicycle, that's, <laughs> that's very Yeah, that's very where things get, yeah. So when you see an accountant who can play a guitar, play the guitar, that's very, very interesting. And an accountant so you're talking who loves about writing, numbers, actually. You're talking about numbers and you're playing your guitar. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's That's weird. the kind of that's stuff weird. people would want to watch. Because yeah. when you think of an accountant, you think of all those depressed people crunching numbers no, in their office. No, it's not office. the case, actually. It's a right. big, big stereotype. And unfortunately, yeah. you have it too. Because, you know, accountants mm -hmm. are actually, are not, they're not like that. They're not stuck behind mm -hmm. their desks all the time, uh -huh. doing all those statements, you know, uh -huh. calculating something. It really depends like on what type of accounting you are doing because mm -hmm. accounting can be bookkeeping right mm -hmm. where you, you are just sitting calculating numbers and putting them on the paper mm -hmm. it can be audit mm -hmm. that like that's what i do like where you move around uh -huh. you go to different places to different companies like yeah. you basically try to find out where the tax fraud uh, -huh. uh like cash crunches there are things called cash crunches where all of those things are coming from and it gets really interesting at that point you start seeing that companies are basically okay positioning themselves in ways where they claim to have cash that mm -hmm. they do not have mm -hmm. and get credibility for that so they make money out of thin air you know mm -hmm. if you are in that part of accounting it's never boring so they like start loving it yeah, kind of inflate their income statement 
Uh, trying to look big no like inventory oh, you are a business major too right y- yeah i yeah, think yeah yes, i saw yes. i saw your diploma there yeah. you know th- what they do with inventory uh-huh. they yeah. there are different inventory valuation methods right there is first mm. in first out mm-hmm. last in like, yeah. first out companies they first do first in first out because that reflects their like uh position in the market most accurately right when they're just starting to sell that inventory. But when they like when it's the end of the fiscal year and they need to do balance sheets, final income statements, they immediately report everything in LIFO. That's a crime, but mm-hmm. most companies do that. Why do they do that? Because their income, if they have like if they keep using FIFO, their income will be lower, right? So at the end of the year, to show themselves in a better position than they actually are, they falsify their income statements by changing the, their original valuation method from FIFO to LIFO. This is just like one example, right? And what happens? They make money out of thin air. They have the money on their like statement that they did not have before. Mm-hmm. What does that do for them? Like people, investors especially, they, look, they start looking at their income statements, right? And they're like, hey, like this company has been doing consistently well. We need to invest, we need to buy their stocks. So companies start like pouring money into them, right? And that's how they keep growing, breaking through things mm-hmm. and becoming better in the market. And don't those investors see through their scam? No. They don't. That's what auditors do. That's where yeah. Deloitte, like PwC, oh, yeah. like all of those big, big, big like sharks come, mm. you know? That's what they work with. I talked work to, with investors. I, I talked to one of the sharks <laughs> actually yesterday on the podcast. Really? Wow. I'm talking about Mr. Bob. Oh. The future shark. Oh, the future shark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like, I'll shark. make a lot of money. Yeah. Yes. He's got that like philosophy. I like he, he's got I like that ki- He's got that killer instinct. Okay. Exactly. He's very he hungry. Yeah. He, he smells blood and he's coming for it. I yeah. can tell that. I mean, uh, yeah. his motivation is just crazy. It, yeah. Sometimes like, you know, sometimes makes he's, me he's freeze under, me out. He's, he's, he's Andrew Tate on steroids. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> he's actually Andrew Tate. When, he, when yes. he was talking yesterday, yeah. I could see a younger version of Andrew Tate, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, that was actually kind of intimidating having him on the podcast, but I like that energy. That I like that energy. That made me feel different. I liked it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Wow. We, we, went over, we went over a lot of stuff today. I got three more questions I want to ask you before yeah, sure, we no wrap problem. it up. Mm-hmm. Right. And probably kind of know what those questions are. It's a tradition for us to end our podcast on philosophical <laughs> note. It's probably going to be your favorite t- type since you are kind of a philosopher yourself. Sure. So what's your personal philosophy on life or is it something you're still trying to figure out? What I'm still trying to figure out? Okay. Like no, I'm asking. I asked if, what your personal philosophy is or <laughs> is it something you're still trying to figure out? Okay. Uh, my personal philosophy on life, it's like more similar to yours, to be honest. Like I was listening to your conversation between you and Bob Mm -hmm. and I agree with you on something you say, Mm -hmm. like that you don't need too much, you know, to feel satisfied. Mm -hmm. That's my personal philosophy because when you do that, that's where your hunger came mm-hmm. and you start going blind. Mm -hmm. You, You start going blind when you, when you are making too much money, like, you know, that's that becomes the only thing you are chasing. I I don't want that. Mm-hmm. I want to have purpose in my life, mm-hmm. but I don't want that purpose to be monetary only. There is so much to life like other than money. You know, yes, money is a mechanism for surviving. Yes, like you can make more, have a good quality of life, right? But you actually don't need like more than what's yeah. enough for you. And enough is different for for people. For example, enough for you, like you say yesterday when your belly is full, right? <laughs> when you are feeding your family, when everyone around you is feeling happy and okay, that's what what's enough for you. For me, it's a little different. I want to have like some investments spread mm. around, you know, so that in case I go broke, I can like withdraw mm. that cash and spend it. I want to have some assets like that will be bringing me passive income and a job I love like accounting, audit, you know, mm-hmm. that's bringing me a decent salary. I don't need more. I want to have a nice car. I want to have a decent house. I want to have kids, family, parents who are well-dressed, affording to travel, you know, and doing things they want. Uh, and me, myself, like basically being a little higher than uh, mid- middle class, like in socioeconomic terms, right? Uh, but like chasing too much, I believe it's not worth it because at the end of the day, you will never feel satisfied. You will get a car, you are happy for 10 to 15 days, and that satisfaction mm-hmm. wanes away. You aim higher, you go ahead, you get a house, you build, okay, you build a two-store house, right? Two-story house. 
you are happy for one month in it. You feel proud of yourself, mm-hmm. right? Because you have done this, you have achieved a point in your life mm-hmm. where you could afford to build a two-story house. And that happens when it's away too. It, it gets really, really, really illusional. As you go on, you, dis- you are disillusioned into thinking that like money, fame, and success is all that exists, are all that exists to life, right? And that psychology is wrong. Mm-hmm. That's not where your eternal happiness lies. The reason mm-hmm. why I started with these explanations is, this is what I wanted to say. I'm a strong believer that eternal happiness, eternal satisfaction does not lie in monetary things, Mm -hmm. material things, right? You find it in different ways. How you find it? Um, Okay, let me me actually formulate it in my mind, okay? When you are thinking about things that are beyond the scope of this world, when you have a purpose that's much higher, like when you, you when you have a purpose that's much higher than this, you know, that's how you're like uh, chasing eternal happiness, feeling peace inside, and just like going on with your life. But you got me, like, right? You got me? Yeah, for sure. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, as for your point about money, I think the reason why people want to make more and more and more, despite the fact that they already have enough, is not necessarily because they want that monetary gain, maybe because they just love the thrill of chase. Maybe. The thrill of chase. Maybe. That, but the thrill that comes yeah, from chasing those things. Yeah, it really makes things. you blind. It really makes you blind, you it know? It does. Because, okay. It makes you blind to the more important things in life. And we're probably First gonna, thing, it makes you more blind to more important things in life. Uh, second, like, it just makes you arrogant. Mm-hmm. You, you might say people don't change, you know, mm-hmm. like, if, there are certain people who make a lot of money, but they don't change, but people change. Mm-hmm. With fame, with power, and with money, people change. They change right. a lot. I, I want to I wanna correct you here, though. Yeah. Here's what I believe and what I think is true. Money, fame, influence, power don't change people. They just reveal them. Wow. I, that's a great point money does that's not change point, yeah. people it simply reveals them yeah it finally gives them the tools yeah to express what's really inside yeah exactly uh, and there's also a quote that goes make your friends rich make your enemies rich and find out which is which <laughs> wow that was yeah. that was a good one yeah <laughs> oh yeah exactly like you're right it doesn't change people it reveals them like if I think about it deep, mm-hmm. that, that makes a lot of sense, you know? Uh-huh. Because, again, there are exceptions, right? There are people who make a lot of money and they don't change. Like, if Bobby John is a case, for example. Mm-hmm. He's genuine to the extent mm-hmm. that, like, even if he achieves a lot, you know, gets mm-hmm. better constantly and constantly, mm-hmm. he, he's got the same treatment, he's got mm-hmm. the same attitude to mm-hmm. people around him. Yeah, the I same case that. with me. He's like, very down to earth. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I always like, like, like staying modest mm-hmm. because I believe that once... Uh, you start feeling better than others, you know, and st- 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 once you start looking down at others, right, looking down upon others, that's where you start losing. Mm-hmm. Because who are people holding you, you know, up above? Mm-hmm. Who are people who are raising you, right? Those are people around you. That's the community you grew up in. That's the community you are living in. And once you start looking down upon this, those people, once you start disrespecting them, is the point when you start like losing your fame, losing your power, losing your money, losing everything in life, karma mm. it might be karma. The explanation mm. for that might be karma, but there might be logical explanation for that, explanations for that as well. Like we will not go too deep, right? Uh, but like, yeah, I just wanted to express my opinion about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very well thought out. It's very considerate. All right, one more question. Mm-hmm. What's one piece of advice you'd give to all those fifteen and sixteen year olds out there watching us right now? Or what's one piece of advice you would give yourself if you could travel back in time? Okay. If I could travel back in time, I would really, really learn to negotiate with my parents Mm -hmm. because what they want might not actually be the best choice for you. Mm -hmm. An example I brought up earlier, right? Mm -hmm. In our podcast. Mm -hmm. When my parents gave me two choices, you either like leave uh, and study abroad Mm -hmm. now or else... Like, you're going to stay here in Uzbekistan and study here, right? I don't have anything to say against Uzbekistan. I love this country. It's my home. That's why I come back every break because Mm. I long for it. I don't just miss it, right? I long for it. This is where I grew up. This is my community. This is my culture. But, like, I really wanted that diversity and that experience. 
and if, at that time, my parents supported me, you know, like prioritized my well-being, like uh over what people would say i think i could take a gap year and do better i don't mm -hmm. regret because everything right now is really really fine it's going like as planet but this is what i would advise the younger generation to do uh learn to negotiate with your parents first of all because most choices they make especially in uzbek culture you know like parents are responsible for making choices for their kids learn to negotiate with them and like work it out if it's not something that you think is best for you. Second, uh, try to carving out your niche now. It might get too late because I know kids who started carving out their niche at 18, right? This is what I want to do in life. That is what I want to do in life. But that's too late. At that point, they are supposed uh, to be starting out. They are supposed to be at a point, you know, where they have already done something about it. But 15 to 16 year old kids, they don't have much time. Like, that's what we tell them in our culture, right? Like, you've got enough time. You've, you have a lot of time and you can do whatever you want, but that's not right. You should start taking action now. Who I want to become? Want, do I want to become an engineer? Do I want to become a doctor? Start asking your questions from, your, like, uh, from yourself, right? Once you start asking those questions, you will have a clearer version of what you want to do. And when you have a clearer version of what you want to do, you can break it down into smaller, smaller, smaller steps that you can start taking right now. What does it do for you? It puts you in a more competitive, in a better stance like than uh, other peers of yours, right? Uh, so yeah, this is what I recommend like to 15 to 16 year old kids in Uzbekistan. And this is what I would actually tell myself if I could travel uh, three years back in time. Because even though I'm doing a lot for my age, right? I'm only 20. Uh, and I, I'm not bragging, but I think I'm doing a lot, right? Like I'm yeah, working yeah, and are. studying You're at the same time, ahead right? Of your peers, but a lot I of your think, peers. yeah, I think I could have done more. Yeah. I could have done more. Mm -hmm. uh, if I work at those things out, you know, approach things more thoughtfully at that time. So yeah, this is what I would recommend, guys. Rush up. You are not like uh, running. I, I mean, you do not have plenty of time. You are actually running out of time. So get your plans done. Talk to your parents and. Pick what is what do you, what you think is best for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. All right, that was a lot of great advice. Oh, thank you so much, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, I tried my best. Yeah, you you tried yeah, the hard, you tried your hardest. <laughs> I mean, this yeah. was one of the most information <laughs> you know packed value packed podcasts we've ever had. Wow. Yeah, it, it was. It was. Uh, yeah. Our our, editor, our editors can confirm that, right, Mr. Muhammad Aziz? Say something. Is it on your top ten? Is it on your top five? Top, top five. Wow. Okay. All right. You guys there are you go. Me happy because I thought I haven't done that well. But yeah, yeah. Top five. That, that's our, recognition. Our, I love it. Yeah. Our expert, our expert here, Mr. Muhammad Aziz. Every time after we wrap up the he's podcast, he's an aspiring legend. He's yeah. a legend for sure. Yeah. yeah like he, his. Like I, only today I realized he's got a seven point five at thirteen. Yeah. I never saw this result before. You yeah. Know? I came here and I'm. And like, that's wow, why. This guy is that's here. why I was telling Mr. Boberjan that he's coming after his SAT. Yeah, he is coming after him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure he's going to be the first, first, first Uzbek student. You know, he's going to become the first Uzbek student who got into Cambridge for his undergraduate because there is no Uzbek citizen mm -hmm. like who got into Cambridge to study bachelor's degree for master's, PhD, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But like this guy, if it's not him, I don't know who he's going to be. You, like, you want to go to Cambridge? <laughs> yeah, he hasn't, he hasn't, he hasn't thought about it yet. So, all right, like he said, like he said, like he said, one step at a time. Okay, yeah, let him get his, let him, though. let him get his SATs done. <laughs> then we'll think about okay. the rest later. Okay. Okay? okay, all right. So, thanks a lot again for coming on the podcast. It thank was a lot of fun inviting. having you today, talking yeah. to you, and sharing in the energy. I can't thank you enough. So, do you have any co final comments you'd like to make? Yeah, thank you, Muhammad Ali, for inviting me. Actually, I always wanted to be in your podcast. You know, dreams come true, and yeah. I'm here. I talked to yeah. you today. It's been really, really informative and engaging, to be honest. Like, yeah. You know, Thanks to you. It's been so yeah. long since I did not have conversations mm -hmm. where I'd be put on the mm -hmm. edge of my seat. You know, mm -hmm. like yeah. this is literally, I would say, where <laughs> I have to think, articulate. You know. Yeah and basically go beyond what I yeah. think about usually. So yeah. it's been a lot of fun and I hope like our audience found this podcast mm -hmm. useful. I'll see you guys around, see you later. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting again. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, guys, if you enjoyed today's episodes, you know you know what to do, right? Go on, like our content 
and leave us thumbs up and leave us some comments in the comment section below. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.